Assalamu alaikum everybody, mashallah, uh, we have brother Sabor and brother Imran with us today inshallah um, I've been boasting that we're going to put atheists back in the box And the way we plan to do it is present basic atheist arguments that they come with uh, That they think they have some kind of um, rationale, reason, logic behind And what I want to do today inshallah with all three of us is factory reset atheists So whatever atheists are watching now I want them to get reset and realize, wait a minute, I was I was saying something based on this assumption. Oh, I thought that, and then reduce it all, and then they can rebuild them up again, inshallah. So basically, we're going to break it down into three basic um, components. Uh, the first one is going to be prove your God. When the atheist comes along and says, prove God exists, what's your evidence for God, and all of these kind of things, I'm going to demonstrate about belief, inshallah. Um, Brother Sabo is going to demonstrate how when the atheist then thinks he brings his ace card of evolution, the idea that, oh, because evolution is proven, then that means that there is no God somehow. So we're going to show how um, evolution doesn't undermine the existence of a creator. OK, and then Brother Dr. Imran, mashallah, he's going to deal with the Stephen Fry type argument, which is um, suffering. Why do babies get cancer? This, that, the other. Because that's answering a different question, because you can't say God doesn't exist because suffering exists. You can say, why does God allow suffering to happen if he exists so those are the three components inshallah then each one will give us like a five ten minute presentation on each point and then uh, inshallah we'll invite atheists to come on and uh, respond to what's been said inshallah is that is that right with everyone yeah alhamdulillah yes sorry i was on mute yeah of course alhamdulillah Looking for yeah. <laughs> right so in the chat usually i speak to the chat you see but obviously i'm not going to speak to the chat in this particular episode moderators keep control of the chat i'm pretty sure there's going to be some trolls here don't block everyone because we're going to need someone to come on so <laughs> if, especially if you see some kind of excited atheist leave them we, we we need them yeah inshallah all right and then at the end like i said once we finish our presentations then we'll invite atheists to come on and um we'll put the link out and you guys can come on and challenge what we said inshallah Right, so I'll begin. Um, when you, not every atheist, now this is the first thing you see, you've got to know your atheist, what type of person you're speaking with. Because <laughs> I deal obviously primarily with uh, Speakers Corner atheists, Facebook atheists, TikTok atheists. So these guys are kind of opinionated. Where you have other atheists, which was like myself, where I didn't believe in God, but didn't not believe in God, didn't care, didn't think Dawkins kind of ideas and that dismissed God. It was just I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't used my intellect, I hadn't considered it, if you like. So I didn't believe in God, but I didn't have a reason to, nor bother looking into it. So there are atheists who are nominal, so you don't need to jump all over with this. Yeah, This is for those atheists who think they have some kind of rational, intellectual higher ground. That's who we're trying to deal with in this particular uh, series. OK, so the idea when an atheist comes to you and asks you uh, to prove God exists, first thing we have to hold our hands up and say i can't i can't demonstrate with observable testable empirical evidence that god exists i just can't do it just as you can't um reverse it you can't you can't uh, demonstrate god doesn't exist okay so because obviously you can't prove something doesn't exist it makes no sense so but if you try to say it doesn't exist then you're making the claim so it's on upon you so anyway so what we do do though is we believe we believe a creator exists. And when I say believe, I'm using the word as its synonyms like accept, convince, trust, convict. Ex yeah. And that needs a proposition. So the proposition is a creator exists. We then look at the rationale behind the reasons. And this is the key you see. It's the reasons why you believe this thing is true. Because what happens as soon as you say to an atheist, um, I believe. Oh, they get so excited. Tooth fairy comes out of the pocket, Father Christmas, fairies at the bottom of the garden, all of this kind of stuff. Because they think once you say belief, that's open season, then all beliefs, everything's acceptable. Well, no, that's not the reality. Because what you have to do, you have good, have to have reasons to support your belief. Because if you don't need, because the first thing you have to accept also is a belief could be true without proof. So someone could believe something, have no proof to support that belief in the sense of prove it's true. But that doesn't make it not true. It could still be true. So you have to first establish that principle. And you atheists, you need to accept that principle. I mean, don't just say, oh, no, a belief needs proof. 
just to win the argument, because like I've said many times, um, there's many things you go through in your life that you believe to be true, but you don't require any proof of. So, for example, when you jump on an airplane to go on holiday, you don't need the, the pilot to demonstrate to you and prove to you he's a pilot and he's capable of flying a plane. You believe he's capable of flying the plane. When you go to the doctors and that doctor gives you a prescription for some medication for some illness you may have, you don't say, oh, sorry, sir, before you subscribe that medication, can I see your qualifications, make sure you're qualified to do this thing? Of course you don't. You believe he's qualified to do this thing. You don't need no proof. You believe your parents are your parents. You believe your father is your father without needing him to say, sorry, son, here's uh, a DNA test we did. Just so when you ask for the proof, I'm your father, here it is. Of course not. This is ridiculous. What problem happens is as soon as you bring a creator into the equation, all of a sudden now you want proof. Yeah. Now, now all of a sudden this belief isn't good enough. So once you accept the principle that a belief without proof could be true, now you have to find a uh, mechanics or, or a way to determine what's true or, or not in these beliefs, because there are many, many beliefs. And so it can't just be the fact if none of them need proof, that means they're all true. Of course not. They need reason. So I'll give you a little prime example. When I speak with Christians and they come to me and they say, Jesus died for your sins. I say, why do you believe that? Oh, uh, because it says it in the Bible. Oh, really? Why do you believe the Bible is a reliable source of information? Because it's the word of God. Why do you believe it's the word of God? Oh, because it says something, um, Timothy 2, 3, 16, all scriptures inspired by God. But that's written before the Gospels. So then it can't be referring to the Gospels. So therefore, why do you believe the, Bible? the Gospels are a reliable source of information? So what you do, you drill down into the people's belief until you find the assumed position. Once you find that assumed position, that's what you deal with. Yeah. So in any any belief system, whatever it may be, you need to challenge the reasons for that belief. And if those reasons cannot be challenged or refuted, then you're in no position to say that belief is false. If you do, then you're the delusional one because you're believing something then that's despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Because belief becomes delusion when overwhelming evidence refutes it. So that's the basic uh, parameters of what belief is. So as a Muslim, alhamdulillah, Allah calls me in the Quran, in the Ladina Amanu, oh, you who believe, we are the believers and the non-Muslims are the unbelievers. See the word believe and unbelief? This is what we are, alhamdulillah. So I'm not going to go into that detail right now because I, I want to really, to be honest with you, if we can, can we leave Islam off the table for this particular stream? You think that's possible? Doctor and um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to start with God first, and you have to establish that reality before you move on to revelation. And I think one of the reasons why a lot of the Dawah conversations become lopsided is because we mix revelation with God's existence with everything, and it just becomes a mess. So you should always start with God first. Alhamdulillah, because the, 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 this is a, a process of getting shahada and to take the shahada the first thing you need to believe is what la ilaha illallah now unless you believe in a creator there's no point me teaching you muhammad rasulullah <laughs> first of all let's get to la ilaha illallah so the first obstacle you'll have when you're speaking to somebody is whether a creator exists or not so this principle that i'm establishing of belief applies to everything so once you have this principle you can apply it to religious things as well as irreligious things. so for example why do you believe that pilot can fly the plane well, first of all, I don't think he'd be in that position if he couldn't. And I must have flown this plane before. So these, these are kind of reasons that support it. Now, no one can say, well, are you sure? You might, you might have snuck on there. It's ridiculous, all right? And why do you believe your father's your father? Well, because um, I look like him, family testimony. I believe my mother was a chaste woman. I don't believe she slept around. So if she, so if she says he's my father, I believe he's my father. If you bring me a DNA test, a DNA test, I'd probably still refute that. I'd probably still challenge that. Because I believe my father is my father based upon my mother's uh, chastity. That's the main thing, yeah? The doctors are doctors. Surely he wouldn't be sat in that practice and all the people know there that this guy isn't qualified. He must be qualified. And the way he talks and the way he understands things. So these are the reasons supporting all of these things. And that's how you determine uh, belief on what is true and what can be dismissed. So this then, like I say, at this point in time, if you're speaking to an atheist and a tooth fairy, and you know, I had one guy, I'll be giving an example. I was speaking to him in the park and he said this to me. Um, prove there's no invisible pink monkeys on Mars, right? And, and he said this in such a smarmy, clever way. So I just said to him, Why do you believe in pink, invisible pink monkeys on Mars? 
And he was trying to be clever again. And he goes, he, well, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Really? I says, why? And then he was stuck. And he goes, well, I don't really. I'm just saying it for the sake of the argument. I said, okay, fair enough. Well, I don't believe in pink invisible monkeys on Mars. You don't believe in pink invisible monkeys on Mars. So why are we talking about pink invisible monkeys on Mars? And that's the reality. So these uh, tooth fairies and all this stuff go back in the pocket at this point. We're talking about a creator of heavens and earth. We're talking about the universe and its existence. That's what we're referring to. And we believe this universe had a beginning. We believe this universe had a cause. And we believe this cause was uncaused. And that's where we derive our beliefs from. But like I said, I don't want to go into it too much right now. I just want to establish the principle of hand to do that. So now it's over to Sabor, who's going to deal with the second argument about evolution, as if this somehow demonstrates or is some evidence against the existence of a creator. So can, can I, before you start, yeah. so I just want, did you, did you want us to, because there are some things, I was just thinking about what you were saying, Hamza. There are some things I know that atheists would say automatically to that. Okay. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the things they would say is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Well, it's not like a normal claim. This is an extraordinary claim. And right. often people say this. So I was just wondering what either of your views on that would be and how you'd approach that particular question. Because I'm sure that's – and what I want to do is I want to people to get into the the real arguments and these superficial type of questions that we can sort of – just sort yeah. of them in the maybe here. I don't think it's an extraordinary – me personally – I don't think it's an extraordinary claim, to be honest with you. I believe this universe had a beginning. I believe this universe required a cause. I believe this universe caused to be, needed to be uncaused due to the problem of infinite regression. So we have an uncaused cause of everything that exists. I believe this uncaused cause must possess power, more powerful than anything we can imagine to have caused what it's caused. I believe this cause must be intelligent because of what it's caused. Yeah. And I believe this cause must be conscious because it's chosen when to cause rather than it just being a, an effect of its existence. So for me, it's not extraordinary. For me, it's, it's, it's as rational as you get. You, you need a cause. It has to be uncaused. It has to be powerful, intelligent, and conscious. Ta-da, that's where we are. How is that extraordinary? What's your alternative? A universe from nothing. That's extraordinary. <laughs> I, would say that's the, I would say that's the claim that needs the um, extraordinary evidence, to be honest with you. What about you, Sabo? I was about to say the same thing. So um, there's nothing wrong with the idea that extraordinary uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. But what's the extraordinary claim? Is it extraordinary to assume inference that the inference that design equals designer or there's a effect? So there's a cause. No, not really, because we do that in science all the time. We do that in detective work. We do that in historical cases. Um, so that's Nothing, there's nothing abnormal about that. What's abnormal is the idea that a event which is completely uh, under normal circumstances, it would not lead to any form of order. Um, something like a, a mass expansion of the universe, this, this thing that they call the Big Bang, leading to order, leading to complex life developing, and also um, the human mind, which is able to access uh, rationally the universe and also have morals and values and these types of things. That's an extraordinary claim to claim all of this can come around by pure chance. So in fact, when someone says the famous Carl Sagan saying that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, I would say, yeah, for sure. But that works very much against atheism and in, uh, in favor of theism. Yeah, I would agree. And the funny thing is, when the guy, one guy said that, I dropped the mic as if like he's like made some profound point, and then like, wait a minute, relax. Uh, Anything else that you uh, would challenge? Oh, what I, I said? completely agree because fundamentally, you both said exactly what I was thinking. Anyway, in the sense that to claim that the universe has requires a cause, we can analyze what that cause might be, is actually the reasonable thing to say. The unreasonable thing to say is actually this universe doesn't require an explanation; that it came from nothing. And now that's unreasonable. So which of those two would be the extraordinary claim? The extraordinary claim would be the universe from nothing. And this is the position, unfortunately, that atheists will find themselves in if they persist with that perspective. Um, so I completely agree 100%. So that's a, a question that sometimes is put forward because it was said famously by Carl Sagan, as, as Brother Sibor said, but actually doesn't hold any weight when actually discussed. Yeah. See, that's one thing I wanted to do here. This is where I spoke about the factory reset. Atheists use these cliches all the time. 
and they're, they're tired. They're old. They're finished. This is the whole reality of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to say, look, you can't get away with this anymore. You've got away with it for a long time. You know, I've had Muslims telling me they were, uh, they were scared. They didn't mind debating Christians because they've been watching Ahmadida and all of this kind of stuff, yeah? But when an atheist come, they were scared. But alhamdulillah, they said, now we're watching the EFTA videos and that. We're not afraid anymore. We know how to deal with them now. We know how to start with belief flex straight away. So all of a sudden they're on the back foot. You know, it's, it's not about evidence anymore now. It's about belief and it's about rationale and reason. And um, like, for example, I did that talk with the brother. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, Sabor, uh, The Blind Spot of Science with the uh, Eton brother from, uh, yeah, the brother from Eton, 18 year old kid, looked about 26, right? And it, he was, re he came to speak to Mohammed Ijab, but I kind of grabbed hold of him. And his conclusion was this, your reasons for believing in a creator are 100% logical. Wow. Yeah, because it, it went through everything and he said, I can't dispute any of it. And he came from a proper philosophical, you know, it was a proper philosophical battle. He but the reality was, huh? He was studying philosophy, and his name Sebastian. His name was. He was studying yeah, philosophy. Yeah, Sebastian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really top lad. Yeah, nice but, guy. Um, so when someone says that to you, your reasons for believing is one hundred percent logical. That's saying your belief is one hundred percent logical, and and that's what Muslims need to learn that the belief in a creator is one hundred percent logic. We can move on to Allah. We can move on to perceptions. We can move on to the Prophet Sallallahu We can move on to the Quran. You can move on to all of these things, but the foundation of a creator kills it. Yeah. And then when we have, like, for example, the Ricky Gervais argument, like I said, oh, um, there's 3,000 gods, you believe in one, I believe in one less god than you, as if, as if that's a mic drop moment also. No, the reality is this. We don't just dismiss the other gods because we don't like them. We don't dismiss them because we weren't born in those particular countries. So I don't dismiss Ganesh and Vishnu and all that stuff because I wasn't born in India. In fact, I look at the, the rational, rhyme and reason for it. I don't get it. So... When, when you go through this, you can easily throw out Thor, throw out Zeus, throw out, was it, what does Dawkins say, someone on Mount Juju or whatever it may be. You can throw all of this away, but you're left with a creator, alhamdulillah. And then you have to move on to, has this creator communicated with us? And then when you look at people who claim to have communication from this creator, then you test their claims, then you determine their claims are true. Then you'll get the uh, Allah, 99 attributes, all of these kind of things from that point. But when you first time, we just found it. We're just dealing with the creator right now, inshallah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so over to you. Evolution, man, that's the, that's the knockout blow. The atheists think this is ace card, man. Yeah. Um, but they got I, us. They got us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think just before that, um, I think some of the points that you've said, um, they're really profound because, you know, even, even from a philosophical perspective, sometimes we can get lost in these very abstract arguments. But when you bring it down to these basic units that you make up the rest of the philosophical arguments from, that's where the atheist loses, right? And it's on these basic points that, okay, so how is it that the belief in a creator is not 100% logical? How, how is that illogical? How is exactly. it irrational? When you make it in, in when, you, when you get your conversation down to this fine, precise um, sort of dial, uh, narrative that, look, this is what we're trying to say. Uh, it's very hard for a rational atheist to deny it unless they just want to, you know, they just want to do a bit of showboating and stuff. So I'm really glad this, uh, what's his name, Sebastian guy, um, he was willing to admit that because I think, um, I mean, even, it's interesting, um, I saw a debate between John Lennox, who's a Oxford professor, and uh, Richard Dawkins. It's a very famous debate online. And it's very interesting because Dawkins says something which he wouldn't normally say uh, um, and, and something which I haven't really found in other works of his or lectures. When John Lennox was talking about the universe and the universe being, you know, intricately designed and the order and this type of thing, um, Dawkins said the idea... The, the general idea that there's a creator, a deistic creator, meaning a creator that created the universe but left it to run on its own, right? Not a creator that <clears throat> intervenes in, in the laws of nature, but just like a deistic creator. He says, this is something that you can make a rational, respectable case for. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's not something I would accept, but the idea that God, the creator of this entire universe with all of his stars and his planets and everything would come down to earth and die on a cross is petty. 
Yeah. So you see, a lot of the dialogue, uh, a lot of the sorry narratives that come out from new atheists, they don't just come out from a perspective that God is irrational. They also have religion intertwined because some of the things that they found hard to believe as Christians, they just see those as the concepts of God. And they're not willing to accept that, some of them not willing to accept that those concepts are totally independent from the general belief in God. So you can believe in God, but not believe in religion. These are two different things, right? Yeah, so I, I, a good... Sorry? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think that's what we have to do. And, and you know, this is a very interesting segue into Darwin's belief, right? So Darwin was a deist, right? Um, he was somebody who believed that God created the world and left it to be. God was like um, an absent landlord, right? From, okay. from, from his perspective, that God didn't physically intervene and do these things. Now, what's very interesting is if you look at the belief of Dawkins and Co., and you look at the belief of Darwin, you see that Darwin would not have agreed with Richard Dawkins and the New Atheists at all. Right, because the way they see God is always oh, irrational. It's this, it's that. The thing with him is he believed in a God when he published his theory in 1858 at the Royal Society, a year before he published it publicly. He explicitly believed in God, and this is according to um, his biographers. And you, you, there's lots of evidence for this. There's a book called Darwin and God by Nick Spencer where he goes over this in a lot of detail. Right. When he published his book and then he published his other works, he still believed in God. His belief in God was rattled by the problem of evil, right? Which is a good segue into what uh, Brother Imran is going to be speaking about. He could not understand how a benevolent, loving God could allow evil and suffering, right? And... His son died at the age of two. His daughter died at the age of 10. He suffered very severe health issues throughout his life for which he had to get various types of treatment which didn't really work. So he had this grinding problem. Why does God allow evil things to happen? So in the last decade of his life, he became an agnostic. However, he still said, in my wildest fluctuations, I was never an atheist from the perspective of denying God's existence. Now, online, you're going to find the exact opposite. You're going to find atheists saying evolution undermines God. Darwin showed there's no God. You know, we know evolution is true. Therefore, there's no God. This isn't by accident. This is by design. Right. So if you look at the most popular atheist book in the world, it's The God Delusion. The God Delusion is central argument, and it's called the central argument. You find it in the middle of the book somewhere, right? Around page 150 something. And the central argument of the book is essentially that Darwinism has gotten rid of design. That's the essential argument. And then the argument goes on to just like Darwinism got rid of biological design, a future physical theory can get rid of physical design in the universe and God therefore most likely doesn't exist. So what's interesting is that if Charles Darwin was reading The God Delusion, he would have been embarrassed because he would have said, this is not what I said. I explicitly said, you can believe in my theory and believe in God. In fact, he said, you can believe my theory and not only be a deist, you can also be a theist. You can also believe in revelation. You can also believe, not revelation, you can also believe in a personal creator, which is theism, and believe in God, right? He, he explicitly said this, right? So what's interesting is in an interview between Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, which is on uh, YouTube, by the way, uh, and I've made a video on this, um, Dawkins says... You can believe in God and evolution. However, because there's a public perception that if you believe in God, then the belief in evolution is incompatible and evolution has undermined God. And it's much easier to show the evidence of evolution. That's why I use evolution. So then I can get people to become atheists. 
So he openly said this, right? And he he's clearly showing that he knows evolution doesn't undermine God, but he's using people's ignorance against them to bring them to atheism, right? So I think these things are very important to talk about. And later on, we can talk about the philosophy of science and why the philosophy of science uh, shows that science isn't the be-all and the end-all and the main root of knowledge and doesn't undermine God. However, without getting into any of that philosophical um, realm, we know that the new atheists lie to people. In fact, I just want to give one last authority here, right? The number one authority in the world when it comes to biological evolution is Michael Roos. You will find his books published all over the world by mainstream universities. He's an atheist. And he says about the God delusion that it makes me embarrassed to be an atheist. This book makes me embarrassed to be an atheist, right? Now, why? Because that book is saying, essentially, evolution undermines God when any biologist, any philosopher of biology, any philosopher of science worth their salt knows evolution, just like any other scientific theory like string theory, cannot undermine the existence of the divine. Yeah. So what we want to do today is we may disagree with the atheist. The atheist may jump on, we may agree or disagree. But something I want ath any atheist to join to first off agree on is the new atheist narrative, which is global, right? Which is very hard to uncover, which is very hard to put back in the box, is based on a flat out lie, right? And that's the first thing I want any atheist who's joining me to at least recognize and let's speak about that first because this is an elephant in the room which has to be dealt with. Yeah, I, can, I completely agree. Again, factory reset them. Take them back to all these things that they've built up thinking they have some kind of rationale and reason behind. We have to demonstrate that they don't have this. Yeah. And, and this is the point. We need, we need to arm the Muslims with this information. So when they come up against an atheist, they know how to take them down in a nice way. Well, intellectually, should I say. I mean, yeah. I usually like to take the rug from the atheist within five minutes. Within five minutes, the, the rationale, reason, and logic is out the window. They're, 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 they're preaching to me. <laughs> and they're, they're making all sorts of claims because the, the rationale has left the building. All right. So, um, so would you say that's your uh, main introduction to the, um, the, the idea that evolution doesn't under, undermine the existence of a creator? Yeah, I would say that's... Why would you say that? What, what, what would you say is that? What, what is it? Okay, let me put it this way. What does Dawkins say about evolution that implies that if evolution occurred the way they claim it does from a common ancestor and all this business, why doesn't that undermine the existence of a creator? I mean, I understand uh, to a point that evolution is the response to the creator argument. So it's, it's a kind of, well, we believe everything exists. How is everything here? And evolution is a kind of response to that as like a possibility. But I don't see how it becomes definitive. Okay. So firstly, like you said, how is it definitive, right? Anything in science um, is bound to change, is bound to be in flux. Um, of course, observations don't change. Um, we know, for example, the relationship between HIV and AIDS, and these are direct observations or, or these types of things. But when it comes to, say, a theoretical historical event, which is based upon inferences and some assumptions, then, of course, those things can actually change. Now, when it comes to um, what's his argument, his argument is essentially we have an explanation for how life evolved, Therefore, we, we don't need a creator. However, the problem is, even if, and this is what um, philosophers or, or, or the likes of um, uh, some, some biologists who are philosophically uh, experienced would say, well, this is a category mistake between how and why, right? So if I say to you, you see this live stream that we're on, Steamyard, and Hamza's den, the logo, and all of this, I explain mechanistically how everything works. I explain the connection between satellites, Wi-Fi, um, how the live stream is working. After all of this, I then say there is no intelligence between this uh, behind this live stream, right? That I've explained how it works. I know how laptops work. I know how phones work. I've explained all the mechanics, and therefore, there's no God. Therefore, no one made it. So essentially, he's confusing how and why. It's a category mistake, right? 
Now, that category mistake, it's compounded by another fallacy that he makes, which is the fallacy between, and this gets a little bit technical, but I'm just going to simplify it, between two different types of naturalism. Okay? Now, if I'm here and I'm starting to have a heart attack, like I'm, I'm going to die, right? And then Hamza says, right, quickly, Dr. Imran, come over and uh, help Sabur, right? Now, you are assuming that when we've been talking to Dr. Imran all this time, he's a medical doctor, right? What if he turns up and he tries to give me a logical symposium of some sort? He's a, I'm a doctor of philosophy, actually. Well, we're going to say, well, that's just fallacious. We asked for a medical doctor. We didn't ask for a, a philosophical doctor, right? Or uh, somebody who has a doctorate in chemistry or whatever. So when we are talking about naturalism, there's two distinct types. There's methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. Okay. Now, you may not know the full in-depth view, but what you need to know is just like there's two different meanings of the word doctor, there's two different meanings of naturalism. Philosophical naturalism, methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism is what science is based upon. Science is based upon the idea, and this, this is more so due to, in, in the late Victorian period, that anything that we study, it has to have a physical effect and causation, and we can't refer to the immaterial mind or God or anything like that. Okay, That's not the same thing, that assumption is not the same thing as the belief that there's no God. One's an assumption, a working assumption in science. One is a belief that there is no God, which is philosophical naturalism. He confuses the two, which is why eminent atheist philosophers like Massimo uh, Piglucci, who's a very famous philosopher because um, he's a philosopher who has a background. He has a PhD in biology and he has a PhD in philosophy. And he's an atheist, right? But he says Dawkins argument is based on a fallacy of equivocating two different meanings and meaning them to mean one particular meaning. So his entire argument, his entire book, you can summarize as the fallacy of equivocation. Yeah, he's confusing two different types. Now we can get into the details of this, but I wanted to give that general overview to show there's a massive difference between the popular narrative and what the academics are saying, which is yeah. why Richard Dawkins, why can't he get his book published as a philosophical paper? You'll not find a single philosophical journal which is willing to take the central argument of the God delusion and publish it and get it peer reviewed. It'll get slaughtered, which is why some philosophers have said Richard Dawkins will not pass an introductory uh, philosophy uh, of science and religion class. He will not pass the introduction because his very works are based on these types of fallacies. Oh, okay. All right. Um, now, your segment, uh, Doctor, we're talking about suffering, because this is another thing that this is the Stephen Fry. I always call it the Stephen Fry argument because he's the one who says, like, when he sees God, he's going to say, how very dare you? How very dare you? And then he's going to talk about um, kids get cancer and poor and poverty and famine and war and, uh, and all of this kind of stuff. And so um, the claim that the atheist, I, I don't even know how they, how they make this claim too much, because to me, it's, it's just refuted straight away. It's, you know, because bad things happen, maybe you could philosophize that God wants bad things to happen. So just because bad things happen doesn't mean that um, God doesn't exist. It just means God allows it to exist. And then you can, sorry, to happen. And then you can ask the question, why does God allow it to happen? But anyway, let, let's um, take it from its nuts and bolts. Um, what? And you're going to struggle to do this, I think, without Islam. That's the only problem. Because it, no, I'll, 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 uh, I'll try and do it without... Uh, right. I was just say that because James S.C. is... Banging on about Islam in the comments, right? And we ain't talking oh, about Islam. Uh, are we, and, you know, we, we're happy to invite anyone on afterwards uh, so. when we put the link out to discuss. But I wanted to uh, touch on Brother Sabur's, uh, what he mentioned. It's something very profound, and that's the, uh, a lot of this was profound actually, but there's something that stuck out to me was this idea that um, atheism is somehow linked with science. And there isn't actually a link there. Uh, the, the the leap of faith that is required to jump between science and atheism is a huge chasm, and it can't be jumped. 
you can be a world record long jumper and you're not going to make that jump because it's not possible to do that which is why sometimes you you think that when 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 scientists publish popular writings that aren't philosophical like in journals for example philosophically recognized they're almost writing out of their lane they're sort of going out of their lane into and delving into things and almost hoping that because the the average person on the street doesn't know the differences between these technical things that they can um get away with this idea um, and brother Sabul used that uses a term and he used it in speaker's corner a few times and i hope he'll elaborate i'm sure it will come up later the most atheists that we meet and most of them aided in the chats are and even you can meet some of the scientists who are working at high levels are what we would call socialized atheists they've been brought up into this concept because they follow something underlying which is called scientism and it's almost this is almost a religion in itself and I'm sure the brothers of all can expand on this. So that's very profound. So there is no intrinsic link between following or adhering to science and being an atheist. So this is a, actually a fallacious position that, because a lot of atheists will come to us with this perspective that I'm a science-based person, evidence-based person. First thing they say. First thing they say. And that's, there's actually no link there. And even, and I think that and even at that point, you have to science be Islam. And you're like, what are you talking about? Completely, completely. But I'm going to try and I'm going to try and have a slightly different approach to this uh, problem of evil and suffering. Okay. And I'm going to start with the very, very basic thing: the label itself. How are we labeling things evil? And I, and I want you to keep in mind um, the atheistic concept of the universe and a theistic concept of the universe, because we're going to try and apply these la that label in both of these universes to see how that would happen. So let me let me start with by and if your interaction here would be great, guys. So let's have a, a an experiment. Uh, um, this is a thought experiment. Okay, I'm going to start with a, a, a person with a chainsaw a attacks a child and chops them in half. Is this evil? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. A person is on, on a stepladder with a chainsaw, falls off the stepladder and chops a child in half. Is this evil? Yeah. It's evil. Say so, so again. A person on a stepladder falls. So this is an accident. He falls yeah. with the chainsaw. Sorry, I didn't say accident before, but I'm clarifying. He falls with a chainsaw and the chainsaw cuts the child in oh, half. Oh, it's an accident. Okay. Yeah. yeah you you say it's an accident. You wouldn't say it's e there's no intention. Okay. Yeah, I'd say no. Great. So that you mentioned the word intention there. Now let's take it another step. A robot following its programming takes a chainsaw and chops a child in half. Is that robot intention in, intrinsically evil? No. 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 Okay. So all of the actions are the same. The outcome is the same. We have a dead child in all three scenarios. One of them we would say is evil, and the other two we say are not evil. And what was the difference? Brother Sabor mentioned it. Intention. Intention. And intention implies a mind behind the action. Does that, that's, that's quite clear, isn't it? Yeah. So if there is no mind behind the action, then that thing itself cannot be labeled with the term evil because that's really just a judgment for the outcome. And so we, we go back to what was, the, what was the mind behind the outcome before we decide if this is evil or not. So now... Take that example and apply it to the universe that, say, for an example, that uh, atheists believe in, that there is no creator. Can we apply to anything that happens within this universe where there is no creator? Everything is mechanistic like the robot is mechanistic. Can we apply the label to evil to any action that happens? Earthquakes, floods, no. cancers, we can't. Why can't we apply that label in those in, in that atheistic universe? It's devoid of volition. Devoid of volition, devoid of mind, devoid of intention. Yeah. So when the atheist even raises the point that why is there evil and suffering in the world, this is a, an admission at a fundamental level that he believes there is intention, volition, and mind to explain the universe. Or behind the universe, it's 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 an implicit within the with the question itself. So you can't even ask the question about evil in the world unless you make this assumption. If you say that if you believe that there is no God, then everything then no longer is evil. It's just an action, like a ball rolling down a hill, like a robot 
carrying out mechanistic things like a guy falling off a ladder and these are mechanisms mechanistic things they don't carry any moral weight moral value so almost immediately what we've done here is we've taken this word evil away from the atheistic world view so if you want to apply it you have to assume god to start with so now let's apply it to so now the explanation that let's give let's go into the, the theistic uni universe. We believe that there is a, an intention, a volition, a mind behind the universe. And so what that means really is that um, we need to explain why this suffering might be here, why these evil things that might be happening, why are they there? So that's another another tangent now we have to go on. So in an atheistic universe, you can't even make the moral judgment because there's nothing to anchor that with. In a theistic universe, now we have to make we have to anchor this somehow and explain why this might be there. So let's go to another thought experiment. So initially, what we've done is we've to claim evil exists is to acknowledge the universe is intended and there is a mind of volition behind it. Atheistic universe, uh, sorry, a theistic universe. The, the way that the problem of evil is often put is: look, God is all good, doesn't really want evil around. Uh, God is all powerful, so should have the ability to get rid of evil and must want to stop evil. So why is there evil? Either he doesn't want to get rid of it and he's not good, or he can't get rid of it and he's not uh, all powerful. And because evil exists, therefore God must not exist, because those are two things that uh, the, the uh, qualities that, that God should have, two attributes that God should have. But let's so let's do a let's do a thought experiment around this. Um, this this argument itself has a major flaw in it, and I'm sure that lots of people already know the the flaw within the argument. And what it does, the first flaw is actually this: what we're doing is we're taking a almost a truncated view of what God people understand God to be. So God is not just those things, all good and all powerful, but He's all wise and He's all just. And there are lots of attributes of God that are deliberately sidelined within this. The second thing is there is an assumption made within that this this universe should ideally be a place where there is no evil, and there's no foundation for why you why why do you think this universe should be in a utopia for us? There's no and this is just an assumption given uh, without that basis. So let's let's t let's do a thought experiment very quickly. Two different thought experiments um, that are very similar, uh, based upon a based upon a possible world where there may be no evil or no good. So, or, or sorry, no evil or, or, or only good. So let's have a look at a universe where you can't do bad things, you can't do evil things. You want to get a, if you want to have a knife and you want to stab someone, it turns into a butterfly. If you think of an evil thought, you know, pink smoke starts coming out of your ears and the thought turns into a good thought. If you jump off a cliff, you start to float. Um, you know, nothing evil can happen in this world. It's a purely good world. So the question then is, is there anything in that in that universe, this conception that we've had of this world, where that we can say is good or that we can say is evil? What do you guys think of that? Well, can we put any action in that universe, good or evil? I, I, <clears throat> I would say you, not only can you not say it, it'd be meaningless to even talk about it. Absolutely. It wouldn't make any sense. And why not? You're absolutely right. Why not? But it's, it's kind of like talk, just talking about four dimensions within this three dimension. It's just a concept which does not exist. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, what happens, in, and I'll, so let's give the counter example, and, and I'll give the underlying reason why. So say, if, for example, there is a universe in which everything that happens is bad and evil. If you try and give someone a kiss... You, you end up spitting acid at them and they melt. If you think a good thought, it turns into daggers and flies across and kills the person you're thinking about. If you eat some food, it becomes poison. Everything that is bad happens. And in that universe, is there anything that could be called good or couldn't, could be called bad? No. No. The underlying difference, the, the, the main reason for all of this in both of those worlds is you remove, the same thing, the, the free will, the volition. The agency of the individuals is removed. So agency really, in, in a summarized way, is your ability to choose between right and wrong and choose and do those actions. If you take those actions away, that those abilities away, those worlds become amoral. There is no good in them or there is no evil in them, depending on the, which of those two examples you take. So to have a world or a universe in which there is good, you require the contrast. You require evil. 
to have a world in which there which you can say something is evil you need the contrast you need the you need the good this is like your if you have a chalk and you want to write uh, if you write on the chalk if the chalk is white and the board is white you're not going to see the writing you need the black board with the white chalk to see the writing and so as as a, as, as we would say that the a creator is the the uh, a, a creator is a, the maximally perfect being who would create a the perfect universe and we and we would have to as muslims we would believe this this would therefore be that universe so the the combination of good and evil that we see necessarily means that this is the best way for the universe to be so i hope that uh, that was a, a couple of uh, thought experiments to do that so if, what explanation do we get from this so one explanation is free, a free will re requires the good and evil to coexist we have that so that there's we're talking about a greater good that maybe we not we, we we maybe that maybe we don't have the faculties to understand fully because we are limited necessarily in our ability to understand and our understanding of what the god was in god's mind is necessarily limited just like uh, if i went to my professor and asked a question i'm going to get to limit of my understanding with the professor even despite his explanations i will not be able to understand what he's saying and that's my limitation of knowledge and it's not it doesn't reflect on the professor the same way my inability to understand whatever the whatever is happening in the world in terms of evil or suffering doesn't necessarily reflect on bad reasoning or anything from the creator in fact for me to assume that i know better is an arrogant position to take um, and that's probably some of the things that we we find people become self uh, self deluding intrinsically they become egotistical and they start to delude themselves about knowing the best thing that god should have done or could have done so one thing is the free will. The second thing is is that, um, and that that explains a lot of the human level interactions. So the other thing that people often bring is, okay, what about um, what about animals? Animals suffer. What what about all of this? Why doesn't God intervene in those things that don't seem to make a difference? Why don't you know when there's an earthquake, just stop the earthquake. When there's a you know flood coming, just stop the flood. You know when there's a fire in a forest, just stop the fire. There's a couple of things wrong with this concept, and I'm just going to, rather than, I'm just going to lay, lay them out very briefly, and then we'll, I'd like to get some interactions from people. I think that uh, people are asking yeah. for this in the, in the chat. So the first thing is, is that as as the universe, God's created the universe with some uh, with some consistency, uniformity. And we use this, we assume this uniformity when we do things like science. So when I'm in my work, and I'm a, I would be what Sabal would call a methodological naturalist, I take the theories that are prevalent and understood and accepted today, and I apply them in, in directly onto people I'm seeing and I'm treating. So it, that is based upon the idea that the universe is uniform. Now, if imagine a world where any time something bad were going to happen, into, even to animals somewhere, God was intervening. This flood was going to happen, flood stopped. Earthquake's going to happen, earthquake stopped. Our analysis of the laws of nature would break down because they would not be uniform. They wouldn't follow a pattern that would allow us to analyze them. So we would end up in a almost chaotic world. And that's so that's one that's one thing that comes straight away to mind that we need that. I think the, the other thing is, is that even even if we are able to explain the, the suffering of animals, etc., the, we go back to that same point that if God is ultimately knowledgeable and just and wise as well as good, then whichever cons whichever universe we find ourselves in when we're undergoing this, and this is where the religion aspect comes into it, this test of life, because we don't believe it's a utopia, then this is the best possible way for the world to be. Um, so that's really in a nutshell. I've tried to, uh, rather than just make it a thing, we've tried to make it interactive to, to underline the point. So the basic thing is you can't even use the label if you're an atheistic universe of evil just don't put the label in if you're going to put the label in you have to assume that there's a volition a mind an intention behind the universe that you're blaming because you're putting the blame onto this thing that is responsible for the universe so you have to admit that when you come with this question this is what you're bringing with the second thing is is that the 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 problem evil has lots of explanations free will um wisdom of the of, of the of this divine being that was beyond us and the assumption therefore within our understanding of what this divine being is is that the universe that we find ourselves in is necessarily the best possible universe that we can be in and we gave the examples of amoral universes or places because of a universe where you can't do bad or a universe where you can only do good 
um, I hope that's a good, a reasonable summary. That, that was fantastic, man. That was really good. Didn't um, bring, didn't, we didn't even bring religion into it, which I'm is fantastic. Sure. Which is what, what I wanted to do. I wanted to. I don't want anyone ha trying to start asking about Islam because we've not mentioned it yet. I think um, for this stream, what we're doing is enough. Let bring the atheists. I'm challenged what we've said so far. Uh, see if they accept our premises. See if they accept the principles we've established. Um, I'll be honest with you. After that, I can't see. <laughs> I can't see many coming up. To be honest, we've got Reanimator. That I think he's something to do with you know that gin and tonic show with Rob. Yeah. Um, and um, he he's been spouting away. None of you are brave enough to come on the gin and tonic show. Yeah, we're, we're here. Just click a link. Ta da! I, I, you know, I said to him, though, Sabor, I said, to be honest with you, um, you do know who Sabor is, isn't it? And he goes, Yeah, because isn't Rob on your gin and tonic show? And he said, Yeah. I says, Does he not have PTSD after his time in the park? <laughs> he said, he, 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 he must come out in a sweat when he, he hears Sabor's voice or sees him on a poster. I mean, he's, <laughs> and, and he wants you to come on his show. It, it's amazing. But um, let me just put this. There's somebody there. Let me well, I mean, um, look. At the end of the day, um, you can have a uh, you can have a dialogue with somebody, um, but it's very important to sort out foundations first. And what I really liked about what Imran explained about evil is sometimes, and I I, I find even um, with experience, the art we can make this mistake of when someone says, "Why do evil things happen in the world?" and they happen to be an atheist. We automatically try and go for there's a wisdom that you, you may not see, which is good and okay. But I, I like the foundational approach that Imran is uh, speaking about, where you, you say, well, firstly, without God, there is no such world. We can have a meaningful dialogue about this. So even if we are talking about evil and good, we're still talking, assuming there's a God, even if you're an atheist. You have to assume there's a God in order to make sense of those terms. So you're talking on our terms, right? And I think it's a very profound um, point that is often uh, overlooked. Oh, Tom, Tom, yeah. Tom looks like an atheist. The other two look like Muslims. All right, br brother, just so you know, th this is just for atheists right now. So if you're Muslim, come out of the uh, back chat. Uh, we'll give Muslims a chance to come with their questions they've got that they want to put to Sabora and the doctor or me uh, afterwards. But let's first give the atheists a chance because we've been jumping all over their beliefs um, and it's only fair to give them a shot. Uh, there's a question, interesting question. It's by Seanus32 at 9.54 he asked a question. Can you put that one up? Uh, 9.52? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I can. Oh, Seanus, oh, yeah, he's a... He's a Swedish brother, mashallah. But um, he's going to go off for the supper club, I'll tell you. I'll tell you that now. He hijacks every one of my Facebook posts and it becomes a secret. Oh, really? Okay. He's a nice guy, beautiful guy. He's so close to Islam. But it, it's the it's the concept of a creator that he's uh, struggling with. And he doesn't realize that we're not guessing at the concept. We believe we've had revelation about the concept. Do you get me? Yeah. Let me just see if I can find him. I'm new to this uh, <laughs> troll in the chat. And should we chuck Tom on while, we'll, while I'm looking for it? Who? Tom, Tom Jump. He looks like an atheist. Yeah, Jump. Oh, yes, we spoke to Tom before. How are you doing, Tom? Pretty good. How are you guys? Doing Hi. well. Oh, and just before, do you guys mind if I copy just this segment onto my channel so I can show my viewers? Um, sorry, what did you want to do? Can I copy this segment that I'm talking with you guys to my channel just to show my? Oh, viewers. you mean off? You mean yeah, that's not a problem. Awesome, thanks. So yeah, my my. Are going to want to do that though? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love hearing uh, you guys. I will listen to the whole podcast. So yeah, there's a few things I would disagree with. Um, one is that the idea that uh, new atheism is founded on the belief that Darwinism disproves a god. Well, that's not really the claim. The claim is that it disproves. The Adam and Eve, that God created just one man and one woman. That's the idea of what evolution disproves. And so it disproves like a literalist interpretation. And that's what Dawkins is arguing against. Not that it disproves any kind of a God. There's obviously many kinds of a God that it doesn't disprove. Like if God started evolution and guided that as a process, it doesn't disprove that kind of a God. But it does disprove the kind that created Adam and Eve. Secondly, I mean, you, your arguments about morality, 
I don't think that's that's not quite how okay, most. Just, just before that, we should deal with one topic at a time. Okay. Um, so, firstly, thank you, Tom, for joining us. Um, give me a second here. So, this is exactly what it says. One of the greatest challenges to the human intellect has been to explain how the complex, improbable appearance of design in the universe arises. The natural temptation is to attribute the appearance of design to actual design itself. The temptation is a false one because the designer hypothesis immediately raises the larger problem of who designed the designer. The most ingenious and powerful explanation is Darwinian evolution by natural selection we don't have an equivalent explanation for physics. We should not give up hope for a better explanation arising in physics, something as powerful as Darwinism for biology. So this is page 157 to 158. And the conclusion, of course, that he makes is God most likely does not exist. So I'm going to stick to my original point, which is that new atheism is based on a fallacy. And that it's not just the idea that Darwinism challenges the idea of Adam and Eve. They do push the narrative that Darwinism challenges the existence of God. Evolution undermines God. And in fact, this is not just me. This is academics who've actually spoken about this. And if you want right now, I could actually play a clip where Dawkins actually says that himself. Uh, well, I understand he said that, but what is, what is the fallacy there? Because he's not arguing that evolution disproves God in that quote. He's saying that The most ingenious and powerful explanation is Darwinian evolution by natural selection. We don't have an equivalent uh, explanation for physics. We should not give up a hope. So basically, he, he applies the same thing for physics there. What he's saying here is that God is being replaced by Darwinism as an explanation. The designer hypothesis is being challenged by Darwinism. That's exactly what he's saying there. Right, for evolution. And he's saying that happens in many cases where you have a God of the gaps, where God explains lightning. Exactly, and then say, exactly. But what you just said in the beginning was the exact opposite. You said, no, no, he's not denying the existence of God using Darwinism. He's simply using Darwinism to challenge Adam and Eve. And I'm mm -hmm. saying, no, he is using Darwinism to challenge the design hypothesis. Right. So when he says there's an equivalent, there's not an equivalent hypothesis for physics, what he's saying is Darwinism only applies to evolution and there's some other theory you would need for physics that we haven't discovered yet. That's not Darwinism. That's a, that would be a different theory. So he's only saying Darwinism disproves the Adam and Eve kind of a God. No, you, you there's, need no Adam, there's no Adam and Eve in that passage. The, that's the explaining the diversity of life. What caused the diversity of life? God created all the different things. That's one of the hypotheses. And the other one is evolution. So when we're saying well, what explains the diversity of life, we're saying if it's evolution, then it's definitely not the Adam and Eve kind of a God. That's the difference. It's got nothing to do with Adam and Eve. Here he's talking about Darwinism replaces the design hypothesis. For evolution specifically, that's the only case it does replace it. It doesn't have anything. And then it. what he does is he he says, well, in physics we could find something else better. Right, well, something I'm, something else as in a different what, thing. What, look, I'll be I'll be look clear and direct here. Yeah? There's a reason why many big academics they criticize the new atheist movement because they use these simplistic childish arguments. And what I'm tra really trying to do is I'm trying to discredit that movement by saying their foundational claims are based on falsehood, right? And one of the foundational claims is that Darwinism challenges the design hypothesis. And you came on board and you said, actually, all Dawkins is saying is it challenges Adam and Eve as a story, right? Yeah, the design as in his yeah, wife. But, that, but that's not all that Dawkins is saying. Dawkins is clearly saying here... And he also says in the blind watchmaker and other places in his lectures, and if you want, I can actually play the video as well, right? Just to show that actually Dawkins is someone that's quite malicious. Um, he's not somebody who any atheist should actually defend. And I truly believe discrediting him is very important to actually show people most atheists do not actually understand um, what atheism is, even what Dawkins actually says. And most of the time, they are simply acting uh, in a socialized sort of capacity. So they're not even thinking about the deeper questions. What is Darwinism about? What is it not about? And they, 
they simply follow a sort of a sheepish pattern. So just give me a second here. I'm just going to bring up the video. Can I add that? Yeah. Can you, can you? Yeah. Can you add that, please? Tell me what you think of this, right? You don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. Now, if your aim is to propagandize in favor of evolution, that obviously is the best seduction technique. But if your aim is to kill religion, as mine is, <laughs> yeah, then, then, uh, then, then just, just let me finish. If, you're, if your aim is to kill religion, then since evolution is manifestly true, then if there are people out there who really believe that, uh, that, it, it, that if you are an evolutionist, you've got to be an atheist, then all I've got to do is to persuade them of evolution, which should be comparatively easy since the, uh, since the evidence is overwhelming, and I'll turn them all into atheists. If anyone, they can... So here in this clip, you can see that he's not sincere. He's working off the ignorance of people. People have an impression that believing in evolution means you have to deny the existence of God. So he's using that ignorance against them by giving evidence of evolution and trying to convert people to atheism. So for me, I mean, I'm willing to have a little bit of a dialogue about certain topics. But when it comes to new atheism, I think it's a thoroughly discredited um, uh, movement. And I think people like Richard Dawkins should actually be exposed for the charlatans that they are. Well, what he just said was that if there are people who believe that if you accept evolution, you have to be an atheist, then if you convince those people evolution is true, then they will be an atheist. But those people are the creationists who believe in Adam and Eve because they wait, believe... Wait, wait. First, <laughs> before, before we go to these are the creationists who believe in Adam and Eve, what do you think about that tactic? of using people's ignorance to convert them to atheism. Well, it's not their ignorance, that's their belief. They believe that Fine. evolution. It's, okay, their belief, is it true or false? Uh, false or, false. yeah, false. So to use someone's false belief to bring them to atheism, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, using their false belief to correct them is a good thing. I think I think you're actually cr talking across each other actually so what what Dawkins actually says right in the beginning the first sentence is if I remember correctly is you don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution yeah that's the first line that he says yeah so just understand I, I'm not patronizing uh, this really this basically is debunking everything that you've said so far he's saying you don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution Right, I agree with that. I mean, every atheist agrees with that. Um, Absolutely. So then, not, not every atheist agrees with that. That is, that's not true. Many, many atheists I've spoken to, and in fact, I've had debates with, they argue evolution undermines not only a theistic god but also a deistic god. So, so I mean, the new atheists of the new atheists, they all agree with that that phrasing. So, the only thing Dawkins said there was, if people believe that you can't accept evolution and a god, like creationists who believe in Adam and Eve, if you can show them evolution is true, then they will stop believing in a god. The thing is, the thing is, I don't, I don't see why you keep inserting words that Dawkins never said there. Why don't we just stick to what he said? That is, that's literally what he said. He said, if no, there are people... Okay, so there's two other people here, like um, Hamza and Imran. Did Dawkins mention Adam and Eve? No. No. Okay. Uh, so, and, and did Dawkins mention Adam and Eve in that passage of the God delusion? No, he didn't. Uh, but you keep inserting that to try and defend him. And all I'm trying to show is, you can't defend the indefensible. He is a flat-out liar. What he's doing is he's using people's ignorance against them and what you should as an atheist do is you should say actually that type of behavior should be called out and that type of behavior doesn't ref doesn't reflect a fruitful discourse that we actually want to have between atheists and theists but he's not using a dishonest tactic you just don't understand what he said i mean he literally said if there are people who believe that evolution and god are contradictory and we can show evolution is true, they'll stop believing in God. That's just some people's worldview has that tactic. Wait, wait, That's not being dishonest. Wait, 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 hang on a second. So he's using people's false belief to bring them to atheism. Yes or no? No, he's not. He's using people's belief 
okay, and showing so, their belief okay, false. You are, I'm very confused. Why you just, 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 just one second, guys. So, I'm actually going to repeat yeah. what exactly he says. And he actually says, all I have to do is convince them of evolution and I'll make them into atheists. And I'm actually going to play it a second time because the first time you obviously weren't listening. An evolutionist, you've got to be an atheist. Then all I've got to do is to persuade them of evolution, which should be comparatively easy, since the uh, since the evidence is overwhelming, and I'll turn them all into atheists. Could if that, that, if could that's you, not if that's not clear enough, I don't know what is. Could you replay that again from the three minute mark? Could you start it from the beginning of this? Uh, that's it. You don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. Now, if your aim is to propagandize in favor of evolution, that obviously is the best seduction technique. But if your aim is to kill religion, as mine is, <laughs> then, then, uh, then, then just, just let me finish. If, if your aim is to kill religion, then since evolution is manifestly true, then if, if there are people out there who really believe that uh, that, it, it, that if you are an evolutionist, you've got to be an atheist. Then all I've got to do is to persuade them of evolution, which should be comparatively easy, since the, e since the evidence is overwhelming, and I'll turn them all into atheists. If anyone, they can go back. So, so again, did you hear that part where he said, if people believe there is a contradiction between evolution and theism? So all he's doing is honestly showing them the evidence of evolution. He's done nothing dishonest there. And then their misguided belief makes them an atheist. But he's not making them an atheist. What is their misguided belief? Their misguided belief is that atheism, uh, uh, sorry, uh, belief in evolution necessitates atheism. That is right. their misguided belief. Right. So that's a false belief, right? Right. But that's not okay. Dawkins. He's done nothing dishonest. There. No, all no. But done... you're, you're missing <laughs> saying the point. So he's saying, he's admit, he's, he's saying now, very clearly, the first thing, you don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. So that's anyone who now comes on and says atheism disproves God, they can they can they can argue with Dawkins because you're no longer arguing with us anymore. He's already said that, that you don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. And then he says the people who mistakenly do believe this amongst the theists, the people who mistakenly do believe this amongst the theists, all I've got to do to them is run with it. I'm yeah. just going to convince them that evolution exists. Yeah. And because they misunderstand evolution and atheism not being required to exist together, they're going to become atheists. Let me ask this question. Sorry, just, just to understand something, because I'm trying to understand Tom's position. Do you believe, Tom, if evolution is true as you believe it to be true, then this is proof against the existence of a creator? No. No. I yeah, all of the new atheists agree with what Dawkins said. You don't need I'm to believe. Not what you believe, Tom Russell. I'm just establishing your belief. Right. I'm, I'm one of the new atheists. I, I would class myself then. So, yes, I believe that you can believe in evolution and a God. Like, there are many... What's the uh, difference between new atheists and old atheists, just so I understand these terms? Uh, there's just an ideological difference. It's not not like a political difference. Well, no, I, what, what changed? I would put it another way. I would say the old atheists were more coherent and were less hypocritical because they accepted nihilism, they accepted right and wrong are mere social constructs. Uh, evil and uh, good do not actually exist. So I would say the old atheist God like Nietzsche and all the rest, they were a lot more philosophical and a lot more coherent than the new atheists. Well, I think you're okay. cherry picking that. Which, which, is why, which is why interesting as well that um, the old atheists actually were philosophers and you would find that Today, the new atheists are actually criticized by many philosophers. So you also find that sort of difference. So it's not just a sort of sociological, chronological thing that, okay, this one started after 2006. This one was a sort of uh, early um, 20th century sort of phenomena. Uh, I think there's profound uh, misdirection uh, uh, that we have to... Th there's a profound narrative which is falsely um, uh, spread all across the world by new atheists which I think the old atheists would not actually accept. So I wouldn't ac accept that it's just a small difference between the two types of atheism. Yeah, that's cool. So, you, so evolution doesn't undermine the, a creator. Right. So everything we've said so far with regards to the existence of a creator, you've got nothing against everything we've said so far. Uh, 
Regarding that one argument, no. But the point here is that Dawkins wasn't doing anything dishonest. All he's doing is honest. Well, he showing... kind of was because he, he admitted he admitted that you could be an atheist. You don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. Right. He but admitted he, that, which means that's honesty. That's not dishonest. No, no. But he's saying there are people who do believe you can't. You can't be. Uh, you have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. What does that have to do? That has nothing to do with Ed Richard Dawkins. He's just showing them the evidence of evolution. No, what they do as a response to that has nothing to do with him. Like all he's he's going to show everyone the evidence of evolution, whether you believe that or don't believe that. So the fact that they have a deluded belief and it causes them to believe something strange as a result has nothing to do with Dawkins at all. Like if I believe that believing in evolution is contradictory to believing in the moon and Dawkins shows me the evidence of evolution, yeah. so I stop believing in the moon. I think what you said today, moon, Tom, is very profound. I think what you've said, because all atheists watching now know this. Um, even if evolution is true, it doesn't dismiss the existence of a creator. So one you thing we tried, we tried to do today is to show that don't bring evolution to the table as an argument against a creator. All right, absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah, no, no, but, but atheists do do that. See, Tom. Yeah, let, let's stick to what Tom is saying. Tom is saying, look, if Tom has the false belief that believing in evolution means he can't believe in the moon, right, like yep. he said, then Dawkins comes along and simply does a logical exercise of giving him evidence of evolution so he stops believing in the moon, Tom is saying, well, Dawkins did something, nothing wrong. He simply was teaching people evolution. That, that's what you're basically saying. But what you're missing completely is that he is using your false belief to actually guide you towards the position that he believes to be true, which in any culture, society, whether you're religious or you're not religious, that would be seen as malicious and that would be seen as somebody who is Machiavellian and is just trying to get things done. So, and, and you know, Tom, I, I always say this, I say new atheists are, they, they act in a way that's very um, similar to religion. Um, so for example, Richard Dawkins, I mean, he's doing something patently, obviously wrong, and you just can't see that. And that is exhibiting a type of religious behavior. I, I don't see it right. I don't see how anything no, is doing I, I, that wrong. I totally sympathize you don't see that. That's because you're blinded by the new atheists. So, so you're saying it's dishonest to show I people can facts? Come back and see that. Can I, would you, would you modify, uh... And, and ju just one last point. Sure. And this I find hilarious, right? So Richard Dawkins is supposed to be a leading evolutionary biologist. And here he's saying that he wants to kill religion. When religion from a purely evolutionary perspective can only be explained in either two ways. It's either an adaptation or it's a spandrel. It's a byproduct of something that was an adaptation. So if something's an adaptation or it's a byproduct of an adaptation, why on earth do you think that that thing itself is evil? Why do you think that that thing itself is something that needs to be wiped out? If it has an evolutionary function, then it has an evolutionary function. So even if Dawkins was right, he would still be wrong. So can I just try and give an example of, of what he's doing, just so that you understand? So if you had the false belief, Tom, that um, the way to get rid of COVID was to give me a million pounds, and I came along and said, and I know, know that actually giving me a million pounds is not going to affect your COVID whatsoever, but I say, hi, Tom. Giving million pounds to it will help you and help me, and you give and you give me the million pounds. What I'm doing is I'm using I'm I'm tricking you, you, knowing that you have a false belief, to do something that you wouldn't do had I told you honestly that actually you know what giving a million pounds to somebody doesn't affect COVID in any way, and that's what's happening here. He's there is a he knows that these people I misunderstand the link between science and and religion, and we were talking about this chasm between science and religion. And he's using their misunderstanding of this link between science and religion, and this particular is evolution and atheism, to his advantage to trick them to accept atheism. Now, or... I, I'm surprised that you're not able to see that. I, I think it's clear, really. Um, but uh... Well, I mean, it's just basic ideology. Like, they can also transition into evolutionary creationists, which happens to many of them. It's not like this is a thing that occurs. He's not targeting them specifically because their ideology forces them to become atheists. Many people do convert from believing in a literalist creationist to a more figurative creationism. Like, that... Tom, that's a total red herring. Like, No, that's exactly what he's saying. Like, you, no, no, no. You're... Tom, that's a total red herring, right? 
We're talking no. about the logical consequence of his malicious behavior. And you're saying, but as a, as a byproduct, this could happen. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um, in fact, uh, someone that does actually become an atheist can later on become a theist again and be more distrustful of new atheists because of their deceptive tactics. A whole bunch of things can happen. This is all red herrings. All we're trying to point to is that it's very surprising that um, while there's a lot of claims made about how religion blinds people and how it makes them act in ways to conform with a particular uh, worldview, that you're exhibiting the same sort of religious behavior I would expect from a born again Christian who's talking about the rapture and, and you know, trying to reason with them. And they're like, no, 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 I believe in Jesus because of this and that. Like, we're talking about something really, really obvious right now, and you're just not getting it. Yeah. And you know, any amount of hand waving or eye rolling is not going to sort out a very tricky situation you're in right now, which is we're giving you evidence and you simply aren't acknowledging it because you're blinded by the new atheist movement. Tom, can I just say something else? Sorry, because I don't sure. want to get to the big evolution debate right now because we're going to save that for the next stream. Yeah, so you're, you're welcome to come on. Um, do you believe evolution is a proven fact? Yes. Right, okay. and what is the proof? Um, well, we wait. can demonstrate it in the lab. I, I actually just want ju just just one second here. You said evolution is demonstrated in the lab and it's a proven fact. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was absolute. Okay, no, one, one, one second. You can say whatever you want after this point. But I'm just going to hold on to those two terms, just to let you know. And then we'll, okay. we'll go off into how, how your criteria matches these two terms. All right. Go on. So proven fact is what you've, you've said. Yes, Tom? Yep. Um, and I'm just trying to uh, understand what brings you to that. I don't, like I said, we don't have to go into the full works because we will do that. And you are welcome to come on the next stream. Um, no problem at all where Sabo will break it break it down. And we're going to talk about how, um, as a Muslim, we should look at evolution and all of these things. But I just want to know what the, what you what you believe the proof is. Oh, when is the next stream? Is that like right after this? No, next Friday. Shall okay, gotcha. Uh, we can demonstrate it in the lab. We can literally observe it occurring. We can watch it. You could, you, you could observe Darwinian evolution occurring. Yes. In a lab. Yep. Okay, and sorry. So, what do you observe in the lab? Uh, changes in DNA through speciation. All what does it change into? Uh, there's lots of different changes. There's tens of thousands of papers on it in biology. It's why the vast majority uh, of experts... Uh, how does that... Because I'm assuming by evolution you mean man had this common ancestor. Uh, that's a consequence of evolution. Evolution is just changes in DNA through mutation. That's evolution. Changes in, in mutation? Yep. I thought, is, is mutation not detrimental or is that a... a Some are. That a um, most are non-detrimental and very few are positive. So, so basically it changes through accidents, you're saying? Yep. So you believe evolution is accidental? Yes. And that's random, been proven? Random mutation, yes. Okay, so survival of the fittest is accidental? Uh, sur well, survival of the fittest is based on the environment. So you have a bunch of random mutations. Some make things less likely to survive and they die, and some make things more likely to survive and they survive longer. And so the bad mutations get killed off and the good ones survive longer. Okay, all right. And then um, what do you believe the common ancestor was, some ape-like creature? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we all came from a, like single-celled organisms at one point, and then where did that single-cell organism come from, according to your belief? Uh, abiogenesis, RNA world. What's that? Abiogenesis, the uh, RNA world, where RNA was formed from clay, from base molecules, and then RNA built DNA, and DNA built cells, and uh, we multiplied from there, from single cells to multicellular organisms, and then. And this is proven. Them. Uh, the evolution is proven. Abiogenesis is not proven. Abiogenesis is a different theory. So it's proven that we, uh, the, uh, the ape-like creature evolved from a uh, single-celled creature. No, that, that's abiogen or the, we've proven that humans have evolved from apes. Yes. We haven't proven that apes evolved from something else. We've proven that apes evolved from lots of things. We've go back a long way. We haven't proven the entire chain yet. We haven't solved right. it. Does, does it still go back to the fish or not? Uh, yes. Tiktaalik. Yes. It's, it goes back to the, the fish that came out of the water? Yes. And it's what you believe? Yes. I'm proven. Okay, brilliant. I just want to know what you believe so we can underline it. So when we do the evolution in depth, we'll... Um, and do you think it was... Uh, is it the silicon or something, the fish that came out of the water? Silica? What? The name Did of the fish? What was the name of the fish that came out? Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik? 
Yeah, I think that's. What was called the, was it begins with a C? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. The fish that first came out onto land. I think you're thinking Celecanth, of the coelacanth, the is it? Okay, um, so we're going to do evolution more in depth, but I just want to say a few yeah. things. About this. So the idea that Darwinian evolution is a proven fact in, in a lab um, and the answer, the evidence for it being the fact that we can observe the frequency of genes changing, this is again a fallacy of equivocation because the fact that uh, we have uh, frequencies of genes changing can fit within a Lamarckian worldview, can fit within a neo-mutationist worldview, is something that can fit within natural genetic engineering point of view, not necessarily a Darwinian evolutionary point of view. Additionally, Darwinian evolution isn't simply the idea that there's changes in, um, uh, there's changes in the frequency of genes in a population. Darwinian evolution is much bigger than that. It's the idea that all of life, the main driving force is natural selection working on random mutations. So what you've said is, you say, okay, I believe in this grand idea, Darwinian evolution, but when you ask for evidence, you're giving evidence which doesn't actually lead to that conclusion, evidence that can fit within other worldviews and evidence which in no way, shape or form shows natural selection as a creative power, which is the, essentially the idea of the blind watchmaker. So uh, none of your argument actually makes any sense from that perspective. Now, even if, even if like, you wanted to come here and defend Dawkins, Dawkins, if he was here right now, he would not defend your statement because you said Darwinian evolution is a proven fact. That is not even something that Dawkins believes in. In his book, A Devil's Chaplain, he actually says the opposite. He says the successors are successors of the 21st century due to new scientific findings. They may modify Darwinism beyond recognition or replace it completely. Now, this is in A Devil's Chaplain. So even biologists like Dawkins and like others, they recognize at best Darwinian evolution the, the central idea of the origin of species is not something which is a proven fact. It's something which is, um, it has assumptions. It has some, uh, um, what's it called, uh, propositions which don't actually make sense, which is, which is why conceptually people like Jerry Fodor actually try and challenge it from a, um, from a philosophical point of view. There's a lot of information which the public is not actually told about that when you see the examples of the moth, uh, the moth particular example that was used, Catterwell moth example about uh, industrialization leading to uh, the blackening of trees, that this turned out actually to be a forgery. And even if it was true, at best, it would show small scale cyclical changes within a population. And when it comes to speciation, we have over 20 different de definitions of species. So it's very easy to try and say, yeah, we've, we've seen speciation in the lab, but what type of speciation? And additional to that, it's not enough to simply say, look, this thing is similar to that. Therefore, Darwinism is true. Because remember, Darwinian evolution is not a theory of similarity. It's the theory of transformation. Now, if what you're saying uh, Tom is correct, then I simply want to ask a very basic question. In 2016, the Royal Society, which in 1858, Dar Darwin came forward to actually give his uh, original uh, origin of species argument. In 2016, they actually had an argument there between two different camps at the Royal Society. One camp was fighting for Darwinian evolution. One camp was saying, no, it doesn't work. So if what you're saying is true, if Darwinian evolution is a proven fact, two things must hold. Number one, all of these scientists are arguing about its validity. They must be deluded. And two, it must be the only scientific theory in history which is a proven fact because science doesn't give you proven facts. It gives you workable models which are then replaced. So if what you're saying is true, most philosophers and most biologists who disagree with Darwin would actually be out of a job. But thankfully, you're actually wrong. These people, they do have a valid point. They understand the philosophy of science. And all of this narrative about the immutability of Darwinian evolution, which again is pushed by new atheists, falls apart whenever you scratch at the surface and you actually know what's going on 
within academia? Uh, I don't think that's the case. Again, every biologist agrees with me, like the entire field of everyone in the world. What they're arguing about is kind of like how Newtonian mechanics was replaced by general relativity. Newtonian mechanics was still correct. General relativity was just more accurate. So uh, Darwinianism only takes into oh, two... Wait, 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 wait. I, 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 you, you, you can't try and correct a mistake with another mistake. Are you telling me Newtonian mechanics and general relativity, like new, it wasn't a paradigm shift? It, it was just like an extension? Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, it was more accurate. So general relativity is a more accurate theory than oh, Newtonian okay. mechanics. So let, let, let me ask you a very basic question here. Is it the case that within a general relativity uh, perspective, that time and space is, is flexible like fabric? Yes. True. Okay. And isn't it true that under a Newtonian worldview, time and space is fixed? Right. Also true. Those are two different things, Tom. Right. But the equations are the thing that's different. So the equations for general and special relativity are more accurate than the equations for um, Newtonian mechanics. But Newtonian mechanics still work. The equations are still correct. You can still use them to a certain degree of accuracy. So general relativity didn't make them false. It's not like the equations for Newtonian mechanics are not working anymore. They still work. You can still use them. This is a total red herring. I was pointing out a contradiction in what you were saying. There is a complete paradigm shift between the Newtonian worldview and the Einsteinian worldview. This is why people like Thomas Kuhn, they wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And this is why people like philosophers of science, they would laugh at this sort of argument. You can't say these are, ju it's just an extension or it's more accurate. We're talking about complete paradigm shifts. Thomas Kuhn, who, when he was describing these par paradigm shifts, he actually spoke about them as a gestalt shift, a complete paradigm shift in the way that you look at the world. And when you choose between two different paradigms, it's not like you are objectively looking at one and looking at another. You actually, the way he described it is like a religious experience when you move from one paradigm to another, because within one paradigm, the terms mean something else within another paradigm. So what I really want you to understand is this. You use the word proven fact. That's, that's the very word that you used, okay? Yes. Now, what I'm going to do now, uh, can you go back to sharing my screen, please, um, uh, Hamza? I want you to comment on something, right? This is just a standard slide I use, and I just brought it up. Um, this is an Oxford University publication, Philosophy of Science, A New Introduction. Science is revisable, hence talk of scientific proof is dangerous because the term fosters the idea of conclusions that are graven in stone. You said the exact opposite. You said Darwinian evolution is a proven fact. And I'm saying nothing in science is a proven fact. If what you're saying is right, why do books which are published by mainstream universities like Oxford University, which describe basics of the philosophy of science, why do they say the exact opposite to what you're saying? Why do they say, don't use the word proof? Don't use the word absolute. Don't use the word um, a certainty. Don't use these for science. And you new atheists are saying the exact opposite. Why is there such a discrepancy between your narrative and what academia, what academia has a consensus on? Uh, there isn't. You're confusing facts and theories. Facts are proven. So if we drop something, it's proven to fall. And we can calculate that with a proven equation that works 100% of the time. Those are facts. But, but yeah, so I asked that... a question. I asked you a question. Do you believe Darwinian evolution is a proven fact? Yes, it, it is. We, we can. So, 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 Tom, what you've described is actually an observation. Yes. That's so, the what thing. you've described yeah. is that if you let go of a ball, it falls. Now, that's got nothing right. to do with the theory behind it. If one theory says that the reason it falls is because there's a pulling force, and another theory says the reason it falls is because there's a pushing force, are you going to say that these theories are just slightly better than each other, or are you going to say these theories actually contradict each other at some level? What yes, the say? theories contradict. The facts do that's, not contradict. That's the point. So the, what you're saying is the observations can be explained in different ways, and that's the point that we're making to you. That right, we're not, right, but Darwinian no one theory is denying the observations that we may see in evolution, but what we're saying is the explanations provided have taken on almost a dogmatic level of belief amongst people like yourself 
And this is where the idea came from of socialized atheists. I, we, we follow our prophets like Dawkins so much that whatever they say, we will believe what they say without actually any verification. And, and, well, and I don't mean to be pejorative here and apologize if I'm coming across patronizing. I don't intend to do that. But a lot of the things that sometimes we hold, we have never even, I mean, I, 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 no one's verified them for themselves. I, all the science I learned, I read in a book. I take the words of the professors and my teachers as testimony that this is the case. I've never looked down an electron microscope to see an atom. I've never you know, sat in a lab and done a, a biological experiment, done many other experiments, but to look for evolution. And I assume neither of you, we are taking statements that other people have given to us from what they say they've observed on trust. And this trust is bolstered by things like peer review, et cetera. And this is the main way that we get information. And it's, and the idea that science and atheism are linked, we're going, we're going, I'm going back to that topic, is a, is a dogma. And this idea that science is proven fact is also a dogma. Because science, by nature, if, you're th if the observations uh, can be explained in more than one way, then that whatever theory you're holding to necessarily is not fact. I don't. Is that, I don't know if I'm making. No, right. That's, I totally agree. Facts and theories are not okay, the same thing. But yeah, so no, Darwinian but evolution. Wait, wait, Darwinian evolution is two things. One, it's natural selection and random mutation. So we can observe the mutation. We see the genes are different when things in species groups when they divide. We know that's a fact. So that's that's the speciation thing, and we know that when they change, um, the weaker um, ones die. We we observe that too. So we know be, those two things are facts. Um, let's be a bit precise here. Frequency of genes changing. Is that something that can also fit non-Darwinian evolutionary uh, models? Yes or no? Uh, no, because that's literally just what definition of evolution is. So, um, um, let me ask no, you the no, question. Can I little, clarify? Do you mind if I clarify for a little um, bit? Let me ask you the question again slowly. Darwinian evolution, is it not true that the frequency of genes changing doesn't necessarily have to fit within Darwinian evolution. It can also fit within non-Darwinian ev evolutionary models. Yes or no? Uh, it has to fit in evolution. It can fit in lots of other models too. No, no, but, but my question was about help. Darwinian evolution. Yeah. No, no, no. So, so again, again, I don't think you're understanding Tom, here. This is how science listen, works. Listen, listen Tom, you, you, you're selectively listening. So no. I'm going to ask you the question at Right. Can I clarify? Under Darwinian evolution, can I, can Tom, I clarify? Wait, you can't clarify if you didn't understand what I said. Under Darwinian evolution, is it not true? Is it not true that this idea of gene frequencies, it can fit within other non-Darwinian evolutionary models? It's not simply the case that gene frequencies changing over time is true. Therefore, Darwinian evolution is true. Are you willing to at least accept this very basic point? that GCSE level student would understand. Are you willing to accept that? Yes, that's called the problem of underdetermination is true of literally Thank everything. God. Thank God. You Which know, doesn't have anything to do with my point. So can I, can I, can I clarify that? my point? Can I clarify my point now? So can I clarify my point now? Wait one second. It was so difficult for you to admit a basic point, and this is the blindness of new atheism. Like you're literally acting like a born again Christian. Oh, this is red herring because it had nothing to do with what anything I said. So again, my claim was Darwinian evolution is two things. It's natural selection and speciation through genetic change. And we can observe both of those things. Both of those are facts. So we know both of those facts are true. Now there could be other facts in addition to those two. Give me the evidence for natural selection as a blind watchmaker, which is what Dawkins' claim is. Give me a scrap of evidence for that. What and do don't Catwell's moth examples, which are forgeries or cyclical type of evolutionary things. We're talking about the blind watch, watchmaker, the idea of natural selection as a creative force, not a force for preservation, right? And I don't want you to conflate the two things here. Yeah, so we see gene modification that can create new properties never seen before in the species. Tom, you've made the same fallacy you've made previously. That is not evidence for natural selection as the blind watchmaker. If that was evidence, all the biologists who are arguing for the extended evolutionary synthesis, they'd be out of a job, right? Um, can, I, can, I ask, can I ask a question, Tom, very quickly? Uh, Tom, what, Tom, what I want you to do is this. I want you to just think of a very simple point I'm about to make right now. Do you recognize that they are biologists who are 
rejecting neo-Darwinism and they are trying to propose alternatives to that model, such as natural genetic engineering, neo-mutationism and uh, neo-Lamarckism. Do you recognize that these people are rational and they do accept gene frequencies in a population changing, they accept that that fits within their model. Do you, do you understand this very basics of biology? Yes, I have those professors on my channel all the time, but they all accept that yes, there is mutation and yes, there is natural selection. There's just also other so, things in addition so, to those. So tell me this, why did it take you so long to admit that very basic point, which you I find- didn't. Why did so long? I didn't, I acknowledged it as soon as you said it, or as soon as I understood you said it, like again, but you're bringing up irrelevant points. Cause when I say Neo -Dar Darwinian evolution is true, Darwinian evolution is two things, natural selection and mutation. And we observe both of those things. Both of those are facts. So we know those two things are facts. So the evolution theory is true, but there could also be other things which could be a more accurate theory. Like my Newtonian example of physics, there's a more accurate theory that has more variables to it. But the Newtonian physics is still true. All the equations are still facts. They still work. And so Sorry the to facts... Sorry, can I just say something? Because we're, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, jumping second. a point. Hamza, one second, yeah? Darwinian evolution is the claim that natural selection is the primary force for evolutionary change. That is incompatible with the ideas which are being proposed by the non-Darwinian evolutionary theorists. These are ideas which are incompatible. These are not, oh yeah, the, it all works together, everything's true. No, that's not the case. Well, what you said there is the primary force. So yeah, they're debating what is the primary force, but they agree natural selection is real. It does happen. And oh, uh, Tom, natural selection being real was known before Darwin. Okay, so... Alive. We, so we knew things look natural selection and th this is why again we have to use terms very, very carefully here you have natural selection as the basic idea the basic tautology the fittest survive everybody knows that right even a dead plant can tell you that but when it comes to natural selection of the blind watchmaker that can actually generate novelty that can explain biodiversity that can explain the origin of body plans that is not something which has any scrap of evidence. And what you're doing is you're, you're committing the fallacy of equivocation by talking about the small scale evolutionary changes, the small scale supposed evidences for natural selection. And then you're saying, therefore Darwinian evolution is true. When Darwinian evolution is the massive claim that natural selection is the primary driving force. These are two completely different things. Well, we've proven we need this it for the full evolution created. stream, to be honest with you, because the whole point of this particular stream was to establish that, first of all, evolution doesn't undermine the existence of a creator. Tom has educated his fellow atheists to that point. So thank you, Tom. So thank any atheist watching. By the way, Sift in the comments in the private chat, he actually said uh, Darwinism does disprove God. So yeah, we're going to bring Sift on. No problem. Of, oh, atheists don't push this out, or you know, the new atheists haven't pushed out this narrative. Um, and and he's actually saying yes. So, he might be an old atheist, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe yeah, I'll learn the difference between the two. He'd be pretty. <laughs> for that. One second, Sift. One second, Sift. Hold, hold, hold back a second. Just one second, mate. Right. So what I'm saying is, so Tom. When you put this on your channel, all your atheists watching will finally stop telling people evolution disproves God. If you if you do that, Tom, you've done our job today, alhamdulillah, with regards to that point. Um, I'm afraid not. So your second point was on morality. Is that right? Yeah. Um, your views on morality. Most philosophers don't agree with what you're saying there. So most philosophers agree that you can have objective morality without a God. You can have so objective morality. Mm -hmm. Who decides what the subjective no, morality no, no, no. is? Uh, objective, objective. Yeah, one objective, second. yes. One, one second. You're saying most philosophers believe you can have objective morality without God. Yep. Phil Survey's paper is the largest survey of philosophers known to man right now. Uh, they all, like 57% okay. agree that objective morality can exist without God. And most are atheists. Like 72% of philosophers are atheists, I think. Okay. So that particular claim is it basically saying objective morality as something that transcends human beings, which is true 
independent of human beings is something which they believe in despite believing in God. Uh, believe in no God. Sorry? They don't believe in God. So they believe in objective morality. That That's why I said despite believing in God. Uh, yeah, so they don't believe in God, but they do believe there is transcendent objective morality. Okay. So what is the grounding for objective morality without the existence of God? Uh, there's many different theories for that. Uh, my personal view is that it's in a higher order emergent property like fitness. So, you know, certain animals can be have more fitness. They'll survive in more environments than others. That's an objective property. We don't, That's not an objective property. What do you mean? It's, we don't get an opinion on it. Wait, 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 one second. You're saying an emergent property. An emergent property, right? Yep. Now, an emergent property is dependent upon environmental conditions. It can or cannot come about. Is contingent. So what? So just to, just to so add to that, that, so what that would mean is that if the environment changes, then the property would change. And and this is something that actually Dawkins, uh, sorry, not Dawkins, Darwin speaks about. Darwin speaks that he says that if we were reared under the conditions of hive bees, we would have a totally different moral uh, moral sort of outlook. We would consider perhaps. Um, mothers trying to kill their fertile daughters as something that's perfectly okay. Likewise, when Dawkins was asked about the idea of rape being as arbitrary as us having five fingers rather than six, that's not something that he could deny. So it's a very fluffy, nice way of trying to defend your worldview by saying, I believe it's an emergent property, or I believe it's that, I believe it's that. But from a purely practical perspective, morality in terms of what is right and what is wrong yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. what well, one second moral duties and moral obligations and moral imperatives being binding upon someone in the same way as theism that is not something any atheist worldview can actually justify sorry so let me clarify my question because you answered it and it didn't, I didn't even recognize it as anything to do with what I asked. So maybe the way you understand objective morality is different to what I was meaning. So how do you understand objective morality? Uh, objective means true independent of opinion or mind. So it's just something that's true, like a fact of reality is objective. Like a standard? Uh, facts. So I would say like gravity is a fact. It's an objective fact. Matter exists is an objective fact. So lots of objective facts. But I did want to ask a question to to Sabor. You said What's that morality, if, morality. I'm trying to understand that point. Uh, Objective morality, law of nature, kind of like gravity. So um, I think it's like a law of nature kind of a thing. But Sabor, you said that if morality is contingent on the environment, that makes it subjective. Well, does that mean if morality is contingent on God's nature, that it's subjective because God's nature could change? Definitely. We don't. <laughs> we, don't we don't believe God's nature can change. Yeah. Um, we believe God's nature is good, right? And we, we have a moral foundation um, and that moral foundation is based upon God's commands. Now, from an atheistic perspective, um, it's very easy, and you did this before when you said, yeah, the origin of life, life is explained by A, by Genesis, which, by the way, I'm glad you didn't try and justify uh, the very speculative models that they have for that. But anyway... When it comes to morality, again, it's very easy to say, yeah, you know, within our worldview, maybe it's an emergent property, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But one thing which you must recognize by now, which atheist philosophers have recognized, is that even if you try and come up with some idea of um, morality, at best, that will still be contingent upon whatever environment to environmental conditions led to that particular outcome. Additionally, there is no way that you could go from that to a binding imperative that people would have to oblige by. There is sorry. nothing. There, I have there, to interrupt there, again. Sorry, Sipo. Sorry, I'm going to try again with Tom. Sorry, sorry, there's two things that I want Tom to justify. Go on. Go on. One is the existence of objective morality without God, and objective meaning it's not going to change due to environmental conditions or anything else. Two is the obligation and the duty of adhering to that moral standard. Because if you have the existence of morality without it being applied, 
you might as well not have objective morality because theistic worldview gives you an objective foundation and an objective implementation. And without these, an atheist worldview is not something that can justify morality. Okay, yeah, sure. So I'll take those real quick and then let Hamza uh, clarify his point. So the we think that morality is objective and unchanging. It's grounded in nature, a necessary nature, just like you believe it's grounded in a necessary God. And so it's unchanging because it's a part of the necessary nature that can't change. Um, and the oughtness is a really tough question. It's hard to answer, but we definitely think, we know the God answer does not answer it. And the best way would be to go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on Moral Naturalism. It, it goes through the entire explanation there, but it, it is, there is, an explanation for it from naturalism. It's just really complicated. Tom, no, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 I have to speak. I have to speak. Honestly, I'll explode if I don't speak. Honestly. <laughs> right. Let me, let, let me start again because you hit behind the word objective and you change it to something completely different. So let me make it again to you. Can there be a standard of right and wrong that all human beings can be measured against without a creator? Yes. But who sets that standard? Uh, nature. It's just a fact, a law of nature. Nature sets the standard. Yes. And are all animals, are we all part of the animals or is just humans have a different kind of uh, morality? Uh, all applies to all animals, all conscious beings. Right. So you're saying, so if, if we want to kill, say, for example, you marry another woman, and she's already got kids and you want to kill those kids because you want, you want her to have your kids. You're saying that's morally OK. M immoral. That's immoral. Well, that would be morally OK, isn't it? Because animals do no. that. No, the fact that they do it doesn't make it immoral. Humans do lots of what makes things. it immoral. Uh, the fact that it's an involuntary imposition on will. I'm sorry. So why is that immoral? Why that, is that immoral? That's the theory that I Who says it's immoral? To. Who says it's immoral? Uh, nature does. It's the nature's moral but Nature law. does it? Things in nature do it. Right. So where does nature say it's immoral? Sorry? It's the law of nature. The so law of law nature of says it's immoral for uh, like for lions to kill the cubs of other lions. Where does yes, it say that? If, if, yes. It's just a law of nature. So just like... Where do you get this information from, Tom? We use moral intuition and moral progress to create a model. Who's moral, moral intuition? Wait, 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 wait. Mo moral intuition is an evolved is an evolved capacity that's dependent again on your environmental condition. So if you have a different uh, moral, if you have a different environmental condition, you'll have different moral intuitions and therefore different moral philosophies. Right. Moral intuition isn't the same as objective morality. Moral intuition is the phenomenon we experience of morality. Like when we think of morality, we we're thinking of moral intuitions and moral progress. Can we measure our morality against what nature says? Yes. And nature says it does this. So where does nature say a lion killing another lion, uh, other cubs is wrong? Well, the law because would be... According to survival of the fittest, it's right. So uh, who says it's wrong? No, survival of the fittest has nothing to do with morality. So morality would be... No, 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 no. no. The lion killing the cubs of the other, uh, of the female, to have his own cubs, which are going to be with and stronger... That's the right thing to do in survival of the fittest, or not? No, it has nothing to do with right or wrong. It's just what produces. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in nature, according to the Darwinism, survival of the fittest, and all of this business. This is part. Nature does this thing, doesn't it? Yes. Nature's cruel, as you, if you like. They say nature's cruel. In, a, in that, I've seen a lot of videos recently where I, I see horrible things. Animals doing horrible things to each other, and then always somebody puts, "Oh, nature's cruel." Like when, for example, an eagle it lands on a rabbit, and the rabbit's there under its talons trying to get away and the eagle's just plucking away at its back. Is this morally wrong? Yes. According to who? According to the theory of morality that I think is correct. And where does, this is what I'm trying to understand. Where does this theory come from? The What's your standard place? theory? What you're measuring? You, you see an you see a eagle on the top of a rabbit biting away at its back while it's trying to escape. You, what are you measuring its actions against? The best possible world. So we compare this world where this thing happens to a world where it didn't happen. Okay, so, so, so wait, wait, wait. The best. Why is the best? What is the best? The, what was it? the best possible world would be one where there's no involuntary imposition of will or where you can't ever force any other conscious being to do anything they don't consent you're, to. You're trying to let Because you're trying to lessen suffering? Uh, no. Suffering, you can choose to suffer. That's totally fine. It's the involuntary imposition of will. So... The best possible world is one where you can never force anyone to do anything they don't consent to. And okay, so, so you said the best possible world is where an eagle can't sit on the back of a rabbit and eat it? Yes. So in your world, then, rabbits, eagles don't eat rabbits? Yes. All the rabbits would be free and the eagles would be free and they wouldn't need to kill each other to survive. That would be the best world. And that's your morality? Could, could I ask a question? That's because the standard, it's, yeah. It's fascinating what you're saying. So... 
and I, I, to be honest with you, this is it, it seems really counterintuitive what you're saying. So I'm I'm going to start from the basics again. For and tell me if I'm misunderstanding you, Tom. So what you've said to me is that um, you believe in a, th a theory of morality, which you say is objective, and you say it's an emergent property, a higher order emergent property. Uh, so essentially, we mentioned that this it would necessarily be dependent upon the circumstances that brought about that property. And if those circumstances were different, this would change. But you said this is like a law of, this morality would be like a law of nature, like oh, gravity. Yeah. What I said there is like, it's related to nature in the same way morality is related to God in your worldview. So it's necessary and unchanging in my worldview. Okay. It's like a fundamental part of nature. Like you think it's a fundamental part of God. So is, is the, is some, is there anything in nature that becomes part of our nature? So this is an emergent property the way we are able to ignore or sideline. So what I mean by this is the lion that's, you know, has evolved to eat, you know, meat as a primarily its source of, of diet, able to go off and become a vegetarian? I would say no. So what I'm asking you is the same question about this morality that you say comes from emergent properties within nature. Uh, what, so the question that first came to my mind is why is it then that all human beings, well, vast majority of human beings, don't agree on what their moral values are. Um, and we've seen many examples of this. Uh, and the common one is something like uh, looking at what happened in the in the Holocaust, for example. Um, but but other examples, you can go to uh, China now. There's lots of things that are happening, you know, around the world which are terrible, which you and I would say are wrong, morally wrong. Object we we wouldn't use the word objective for that. Why is this? Why is this? Uh, Morality, which is derived from nature, not uh, something that is, is binding upon us. How are we able to go against our nature? Yeah, so there's two things we asked there. One was how can we go against a law of nature or something like that? Well, there's certain laws that are not like binding, like gravity. We can go against gravity. We can fly. We can build spaceships and things. The law isn't powerful enough to force us to abide by it, it but it does suggest that we should go in a certain direction. So the moral law is the same kind of a thing. It has an impact on us emotionally that we can feel, but it's not so strong that it forces us to abide by it. So that's why potentially a lion could become a vegetarian if we changed his biology a little bit and gave it the technology to become a vegetarian. But the second thing you asked was how can we, why is there disagreement, moral disagreement? Well, we know that our brains are not, are fallible. We make mistakes all the time. People have delusions, illusions. We see things funny and people can disagree about what there's that. I forget. There's the color that dress that's like white or blue on the internet. There was a big meme about it and people disagreed. Well, was it white or was it blue because of the way their brains processed information? Some were right, some were wrong. And so that's the same re applies to morality is that just like our brains can miss uh, misdiagnose certain things about reality, like the color of a dress. It can also misdiagnose intuitions about morality. It's just a so, feature of the brain. Excellent. So uh, that's you know that's really what I was hoping that you were going to say something along this line, because what you're saying to me is that um, we can see it differently. We can sense it differently. We can respond to it differently, and therefore this morality that we have within us, uh, you say, is an emergent property that comes because of the laws of nature. Um, is something that we can be viewed differently depending upon your senses. So that would make it any everything but objective. Yeah. So, for example, for uh, and I'm, I don't, and I'm bringing religion into this, for a theist, for example, if we have uh, a transcendent anchor for our morality, it doesn't matter on my particular way of seeing it or Hamza's particular way of seeing it or anyone else's particular way of seeing it, it would be the same. I cannot from my own senses say, well, actually for me, this doesn't really apply. I'm going to do something else. And so I, th I think that it's a great, it's a good attempt at trying to show uh, a, a more, uh, an objective morality within an, a natural world, but a natural world is necessarily bought, uh, dependent upon the circumstances that brings it about. And the fact that we, you said we're fallible and our senses are fallible and therefore its impact upon us is variable speaks against the, the whole idea of being objective in the first place. So I don't, I'm not really getting what you're saying, Tom, if I'm honest. Well, if can I ask you, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, well, we can see the dress. We know that there's a, a picture of a dress, and it's for, to some people it looks white, and to some people it looks blue. We see it differently. But sure. there is an objective truth there. The dress is actually a blue dress. We know for a fact that as we can actually, people who own the dress can show you the dress. So the fact that people see it doesn't mean there isn't an objective truth to the color of the dress. They just have, their their senses are not correct. Their senses are not objectively perfect. Sure. So, so morality... So you're, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tom. I know that we've been doing that a lot, and I apologize for that. But 
what what this is the point exactly the point that I'm making. Uh, when you have a a, 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 a morality morality that's grounded in a transcendent being like a creator, it doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what somebody else is seeing. Like you're saying, the owner is telling you this is how it is. Now, the fact that we everyone else is trying to interpret this uh, the color of this dress tells you that their their interpretation is not objective. What they need is the owner to tell them this is the objective color, irrespective of your perspective, irrespective of your view. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. I say that we need to filter out which intuitions are the correct ones and incorrect ones and find some objective way to find the truth. Because I think that you, they're right. The fact that our senses are fallible means there needs to be some objective thing independent of our senses, like a law of nature. Laws of nature are objective. And so if there's a law of nature that is morality and we can discover that law, then we can find out whose intuitions are correct and whose intuitions are incorrect. And we can know what objective morality is, just like we can know what the color of the dress is. But the, the, this is the, so. This is where the other. So one is the idea of that perceptions can change, and therefore what we're looking at can be looking appear different to us, unless the owner of that uh, drastic, for example, that you've used tells us what it is. Um, the second thing is actually that uh, this emergent property that comes from our evolution, essentially, and uh, if the circumstances of the evolution were different, then the emergent property would be different. So there is a certain property in, in water, for example, the molecules separately don't show this property of wetness. But when you bring them together in a sufficient quantity, we get this property of wetness. Now, if the if the if the structure of the atoms was different and the electrons, you know, the, the particle, the, the way that they deal with electrons was different and we didn't get the hydrogen bonds, for example, then you wouldn't get this emergent property occurring. You may get something else occurring and that would have depend upon the original circumstances. So what we're seeing is that let's let's take for example let's assume that what you're saying is right that you have an emergent property within you that gives you a sense of morality if the if the fundamental underlying circumstances that brought this about were different then you would have a different emergent property with a different set of um uh, moral values based upon that does that make sense yeah yes absolutely but the emergent property isn't in me the emergent property is a law of nature it exists like gravity so it's it's a thing that exists in the universe independently the same, of me the same would apply i think well the, do you remember how you, you believe that morality is a part of god's nature and so if god could change well then that would make morality subjective but god so, can't change right yeah definitionally yeah definitionally god cannot change so but, in my worldview the same thing applies to nature definitionally that part of nature can't change it's a necessary part of nature okay. so it would be the same solution to how you think morality is objective because it's tied to god but god can't change so that's fine so i think how, it's how is it so that's really great great so you're trying to what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring a counter to the idea that nature is ever changing by saying this bit of nature doesn't change because nature by definition is evolving because you know we had the from the inflation to um the um inanimate inanimate things being uh, in existence to abiogenesis the formation of you know self-replicating proteins and then to these creatures that evolve this is the theory behind it so everything is changing we, we don't see a static nature unchanging nature everything actually is changing it seems almost ad hoc that you're bringing in a unchanging part of nature. It all, all, almost seems to be that you're bringing it in as a convenience to respond to the, the theist claim that God is unchanging definitionally. So where, where are you, what's your evidence to say that anything, that this part of nature is unchanging? Where are you getting this from? Uh, laws of physics. So uh, parts of nature change, but most of nature doesn't change. Like the laws of physics, second law of thermodynamics, first law of energy cannot be created or destroyed. The, sec the third and fourth law, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, those things don't change. Um, so there's lots of parts of nature that don't change. The vacuum states don't change. Um, our discoveries in emergent space time doesn't change. All of the basic physics are not changing. Um, certain things change, like interactions between particles. But Isn't quantum, quantum mechanics changing the physics? No, no. That's the it's vacuum not states. It's not understood, but that's different. That's different. Yeah. Can so I just ask I... a question to you, Tom? Sure. Are you a vegetarian? No. You're not vegetarian, so you think it's morally okay to eat animals? Nope. I think I'm immoral for eating meat, but I really just like. Oh, meat you think you're immoral for eating meat? Okay, that's cool. Yep. <laughs> and and do you, do you accept if a because uh, you know evolution obviously doesn't disprove a creator, so you must have other reasons for rejecting a creator. Um. If this theistic creator does exist, do you accept that should be the standard of objective morality if it created everything and laws? 
Uh, no, because I think there's problems with that. Called like the Euthyphro dilemma, I think is a good objection. Like even if God exists, I don't think it could actually work as a basis of objective morality. Because for so you don't you you don't think a creator that created everything and knows how everything works to the smallest detail and knows what's benefits and knows what harm isn't the standard of what's right and wrong for a human being? No, I don't think that works because of the is ought distinction and the Euthyphro dilemma. They seem of to the disprove what? that. The, the Euthyphro dilemma. What was that? Uh, is something good because God says it's good, or did God say it's good because it's good based off of an independent standard? It's a uh, dilemma Euthyphro asked in one of his dialogues. And the problem is, is that if it's only good because God says it's good, well, then it's arbitrary. But if God says it's good because it's good on an independent standard, well, then you don't need the God because it's why, why is it? Oh, sorry, 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 forgive me, forgive me. So if God says something is good objectively for human beings. Why is that arbitrary? Because it's only good because God said it. Like if I, oh, if I was walking, that, the whole point. so, so like, let me give you an example. Like if I was walking down the street and you asked me, well, what's, what is three feet long? And I just said, that stick, that stick is three feet long. Well, if it's only three feet because I chose it, well, I could have chosen any stick of any length and said, well, this is the three foot long stick. So the actual length of the stick is arbitrary. No, but no, if no, I said, no, no, you misunderstood my man. Okay. If this theistic God exists, it created us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it knows what benefits us, yeah? Sure. And it knows what harms us, yeah? Yep. And it knows what actions lead to that harm, and it knows what actions lead to that good, isn't it? Sure. So following that guidance would be objective standard of do we what's right and what's wrong, isn't it? No, that would be consequentialism. That would not be objective morality. What? Uh, doing something because it's good for I'll you. I'll make it easy for you. I'll make it easy for you. We believe our theistic creator says alcohol is bad for you and forbidden okay if that creator does exist then that standard would be the correct standard with, when it comes to measuring the right or wrong of alcohol would you not agree well no that's the part that we can't actually say why is it wrong to drink alcohol is it just wrong no no, no that's not the point here if the, if the creator says it's wrong it's wrong well, that's the point of the Euthyphro dilemma. The reason that doesn't work is objective morality is you have to um, give a reason why is it immoral. Is it moral because the God said it? If I tell my daughter something, it's wrong. I don't need to give her the full details why it's wrong. I know it's wrong because I know more than she does. She can't comprehend certain danger and such. I can. I don't need to go to the full details. I say, look, just listen to me. You know I'm your father. You know I know more than you. And she'll listen to me, yeah? Sure. Right. Hopefully. Now, Right. So in the same sense, the creator knows me better than I know myself. So some dangers I can't comprehend, my day, my creator can comprehend. So therefore, it only makes logical sense for me to measure my right and wrong to the standard, which is the one who created me, who knows more than I know. Would you not agree? No, that's where most philosophers oh, oh, say that doesn't right. work. If you think you know what's better for you than your creator, you're delusional, mate. It's not about knowing what's better. It's about what morality is. So the question that's is... That's what morality is, you see, is to benefit you. Well, that's consequentialism. So I don't think... No, that's that. no, 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 no. That's only through, in your worldview. In a theistic creator's worldview, it is not uh, consequentialism. It's actually deliberate. What, what, what benefits you? That's literally the definition of consequentialism. No, consequential when it just ac accidentally benefits you. So, for, for example, if my creator knows that alcohol is bad for me and he says don't drink alcohol and then I don't drink alcohol and then I see the people who do drink alcohol, it is bad for them. Therefore, my, it's not a consequence, is it, in that sense? It's basically me following the advice of my supreme guide. Uh, consequentialism is the position in philosophy that you should do what's good for you and that's what's moral. But who determines what's good for you? whatever it's like any determined any version that does that is a kind well, of consequential this is the whole point here you see i'm saying to you the one who created you knows what benefits you and so okay. that should be the standard. so like for example my daughter knows i i know what benefits her so when i tell her to do something she'll follow that guidance because she trusts in me that i know this thing better than she knows this thing okay so when it comes to a creator that created everything remember this is in the worldview of a theistic creator a creator that created everything for a purpose, designed everything to the smallest detail, and it tells man, this is good for you and this is bad for you. That's what we call objective morality, objective right and wrong. So any human being in the world, no matter which country, no matter which tin pot dictator, their actions get measured against the creator's standard, not their own standard. You understand?
Right. That's that's how consequentialist models of morality work. But the reason is we can prove that those kind don't work because of like the lion example used earlier. It might be beneficial for me to kill my neighbor and take his money or whatever, but that doesn't make it good. It's not good just because it benefits me. It's still morally wrong. So the fact that something that benefits me doesn't make it moral. And so the, just because it's good for you doesn't mean it's moral to do it. There can be things that are good for no, you. I, said that that. you... I didn't say that, did I? I said the standard of morality, what's right and wrong. Right, and right. what's so, right and wrong, when you follow what's right, you benefit. Right. So and the benefit you... thing the benefit thing is the problem that may not be correct. So just it, because it you benefit, correct. just because it you benefit, just, just because you benefit doesn't mean it's good. Benefit, you can benefit no, from no, bad things too. Because you, the one who created you said it's good. That that's that's why it's arbitrary. That's the euthyphro dilemma. That that doesn't work. That's why most philosophers reject that. I don't even understand what that even means. Your creator tells you something's good, and you're saying that doesn't work. How does I don't get it? It's why is it good? Just because the God said so. If, let's imagine this: what your wildest imagination that you you atheists always crave. God appears to you, and empirically observable. Test it. I am God. I'm going to do things that only God can do. You agree? I'm God. Thank you. Right. Don't drink alcohol. It's bad for you. Are you going to go and drink alcohol? Uh, I would ask why. I, I wouldn't just agree to it one way or the other because the fact that he said so doesn't make it true or false. That's the, that's so, the so point. Your creator now has told you as a command, don't drink alcohol. Right. You I, still I, drink alcohol. Yeah, I, I wouldn't act one way or the other. You wouldn't listen to God. Commands don't mean anything. You'd have to give a reason, an argument behind the, the command. I wouldn't just obey. What, 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 what if you can't comprehend the reason? then he should try and if he can't then i'm not going to understand it so i won't listen to it do you need to understand it or do you just follow the guidance of your the god no i need to understand it i would need to understand it to actually listen to follow it so if you don't have the capacity to understand then you wouldn't obey god even correct. if, if, if i if i can't understand something i wouldn't follow it at all so really? i would always, yep so if you can't understand to do something in your life you won't do that thing yes if, if it you can understand how medicine works you won't use that medicine yeah, I usually I don't trust medicines. I don't work like alternative medicines. I don't use them. I wait oh, for okay. the. You know how cars work. Yes. You know how planes fly. Yep. Really? Yeah, like the how engines. Uh, turbo turbocharged engines. What they do is they have uh, multiple layers of fans that all compress the air and shoot it at faster speeds and generates heat, and then the heat pr propels the engine and makes it look fly. Right. So you don't do anything unless you know how it works. Uh, I don't trust anything unless I know how it works. So when you're using your mobile phone, you know how the mechanics of the mobile phone works? Yep, quantum mechanics. They use, right, they so use What? They they use certain kinds of shapes in order to generate quantum mechanical frequencies that can then transmit the signal. Quantum yes. mechanics this is how mobile phones work? Yes, it is. Did you not know that? Really? Very cool. mm -hmm. So you're saying that so someone in life who may be not as educated as you, are you self-educated, can I ask? Uh, on a lot of things, yeah. I didn't go to school for everything. Right, so you just picked this up from where? Um, research. I research it, test it, build stuff. Okay, so let's say there's somebody who doesn't have your capacity of knowledge of learning and such. Um, what do they do in this scenario? Test stuff. So you, you can say if I have, so they, a have to, they have to learn how a plane flies and how a car drives and how a mobile phone works. Oh what no, do you, you don't do? have to. You don't have to go that deep. You can do a simple test. You say if a car works, then the car will be able to get person A from point A to point B. And say right. person A did go from point A to point B, then that's evidence the car works. Right. So every law that is put on you by your government, yeah. You have to know why everything it, it why it dot the i's cross the t's in that. I'm just uh, trying to understand that. Yeah, I, the so why here's, here's why I see it, Tom. Let me tell you how I see it. If the one who created everything exists tells me this is good and this is bad, I'm following that guidance, man. Yeah, I, yeah? I can't I'm blame not you. So arrogant, I'm not so arrogant that I can think I can uh, try and rationalize the mind of God. Yeah, unlike yourself, unfortunately. Yeah, if if this is God we're talking about here, the creator of everything. Your evolution is out the window at this point. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You, you're. If if this theistic God exists, don't forget everything comes now. Paradigm shift here now. Yeah, there's a remember, hell. Fight. Remember, God, God, and evolution can both exist at the same time, right? Yeah, no, but I'm talking about theistic God that has told you that there's a hellfire, there's a paradise, there's light, when you die, it's not the end, and all of these things, and has told you then follow these the, these rules, these laws, or these consequences. Would you follow the laws? Uh, no, I would. You'd have to explain them to me. I wouldn't just blindly follow anybody just Tom, because. Can I ask you a question, Tom? Sure. Is there, is, there any, is there anything that you don't understand? Sure, lots or, of stuff. Or, or would not have the capacity to understand? Shh, probably. Okay. Um, and if 
Uh, do you do you understand the concept that the the theists have about the creator is that his knowledge is unmeasurable? Yeah, um, omnipotence or omniscience, omniscience. So it knows all things. His knowledge is is unmeasurable. Mm -hmm. So definitionally, there are going to be things that the creator would know that you're not going to even be able to comprehend. Sure, that's that a reasonable thing to say. Absolutely. So in what capacity that? So this is sort of um, your sort of. We're talking about epistemic humbleness and knowing the limits of your ability to know things. Yeah. So this is intrinsically part of the theistic mindset. When we're when there are there are things that we will be able to explain. So the alcohol is a clear thing. So you you just look at any so you just look at any society where alcohol is widely taken, um, and just look at a Friday night and go to the your your local hospital. And it will be full of people who are uh, either um, injured themselves because they were involved in alcohol use or have injured others because alcohol was being used or um, have had some sort of uh, trauma because they crashed a vehicle, etc. And we see the detriment to the society within that because of this specific use. So in the and even starting from Thursdays now, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, A&E will be full of people who are damaging themselves because of alcohol. So objectively, alcohol is bad for society. We know that societies in the past have tried to curtail it. So we had the prohibition in the, tw in the 20s in America, for example, that didn't really work. <laughs> had the opposite effect, yeah. It had the opposite effect. People were going underground and, and drinking even more. So the idea that, uh, and this and this not this is not a um, unknown thing. And we have a similar thing with sort of smoking. It, the, the link with our, with uh, cancer is almost you know undeniable. undeniable. But there are people who are still drinking alcohol who are still uh, sorry still smoking and the, and the, and effects are happening so knowledge itself doesn't lead to adherence or, or changing your behavior in any way whatsoever right so th there are there are things that you're not going to there are things that you will not be able to understand that may be good for you or they may be or, or you're not going to understand that may be bad for you that are being in a position to tell you these things is going to be able to say okay because we've agreed that this being is is God, so I'm not saying I'm making you into a theist here, but I'm saying that we've agreed as a as a foundation for our understanding that this being is uh, all knowing, and so his advice to us or information given to us from that being is going to be, if we're talking about morality, the standard. Okay, now so that so then we would apply that standard in our lives so this is where we get the objectiveness so there is no societal construct that could happen for example that said it would be okay to kill six million jews for example that i could adhere to because my religious uh, my morality comes from a place beyond this and so i can have, that's where my objectiveness comes from irrespective of whatever is emerging as a property of morality within my society i can counter that now, what you do is what you seem to be doing is you're what you're saying is that actually, unless I can think this and understand this, I won't do this. And that that's certainly true to a certain extent. But then there's a limit to that understanding and that capacity. So, for example, if you're reading a book on, you know, I, I don't, let's think of rocket science. Yeah. You get 99 percent or 98 percent of what's being written. You get it all. You work out the equations. Yep. Yeah, thrust, propulsion, gravity. Except I get it all. But then there's 2% of it that you don't understand. Are you going to reject that? Or are you going to try, are you going to say, okay, because everything else has been so accurate and true and I've got a good foundation for accepting this, I'll accept this as well. Or are you going to reject it? Uh, I would object it until I could test it. So I'd say these two things I can't test. I'll say if they're true, then we'll do this test to see if they're true. And then like if they get it right, they're like, okay, that works even if I don't understand it. So okay. If you can test it, I'd accept it, but I wouldn't just accept it on blind faith. No. Okay. So the, then, the, this the question that follows from this position. So you're saying the only things you test and can establish, you accept. Yeah. Can you About tell me? The world, so not, not the conceptual things like one plus one equals two. Things in your head, you don't need to test. Yeah, you can just think yeah, about. Yeah, of course, we agree. We agree. So, can you give me an example of any scientific evolutionary experiment that you verified and so therefore accepted? um all kinds of them like yeah like the internal combustion engines you can verify oh, no, uh, evolutionary oh evolutionary yeah uh you, you can do petri dish experiments actually well, have, no, i'm asking about you specifically because mm -hmm. we're talking about you yep. and yep. accepting knowledge that may be beyond you for example yes so uh in so high school in terms of taking a theory 
uh, that sort of propounded. So we're talking about evolution within this petri dish. That this the example that you gave us. You said it was proven a fact. Tell me what you have, uh, what experiment you've done for yourself to verify that this is uh, uh, the case. And so establish for yourself this is true, and therefore you've accepted it. Yeah, we do the experiment in high school where we use uh, petri dishes in order to create certain kinds of. Uh, bacteria to grow and have diverse genetic changes and then we can see the genetic changes and see the how some of them survive better in certain environments and get natural selection so we have both of those things that we do confirm in high school through those experiments or I, I personally did in high school so no, so those experiments you're talking about uh, back antibiotics and bacteria yeah where you put the ring into the agar dish and you have the bacterial colonies and you put the put the different uh, dots of antibiotics and you get a ring around them yeah yep I'm pretty sure that's it so tell me, where, where in that did you see the genetic change? Uh, well, we did the experiments where we take, I forget what it's called, this like blue gel. We take different samples of the bacteria and we structure their DNA. And we can see the differences in the DNA from the different things. So, we, so in high school, you were doing DNA analysis. Yep. They, it's that blue gel stuff where you sequence the DNA by putting it in and it divides it up in a certain amount of ATCs and Gs. So you were. So I'm. I, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time accepting what you're say, saying, Tom. So, the, the how you don't mind me asking how old you are, Tom? Thirty-two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I. So I would. I would posit that you that you haven't seen. I, and I know I'm. I'm saying that what you're telling me isn't true, and I don't mean to be offensive at all. But I'm saying that I don't think that you've seen genetic changes. Um. I would say that, and I, I don't think I don't think it's reasonable to say that in high school we would look at what would what would be given is you're given a theory, and you would carry out a basic experiment to talk about, uh, and what you're seeing actually in the petri dish is something called adaptation. It's not actually evolution into different species or anything, or, or even speciation. You're seeing adaptation. So it, within within the within the existing um, gene pool that you have there you see that you see the bacteria adapt to whichever bacteria whichever antibiotics that you're putting in them i don't think that that's genetic changes that you're seeing i think that's i'll be very surprised if you were doing genomic research within high school i'd be very surprised by that oh yeah that's just the the natural selection kit the natural selection part the genetic sequencing part is the other kits there are genes and consequences classroom kits that actually do the genetic sequencing that you can buy for high schoolers so, uh, so there's two different experiments we do. We do the petri dish point, one, and then point, we take yeah, the DNA lost... and we... Sorry, Tom. At this oh, point, we've lost Sabor. Um, his, uh, his laptop failed on him, and his phone's got rubbish connection. So what we're willing to do, Tom, um, we want to continue with you in two weeks' time, inshallah. Um, so two yeah, weeks' time. Please come back. And we're going to start again with morality and whether atheists can be good. And, and then we'll do a breakdown of evolution and the different... Um, Forms of it, yeah. You awesome. Have to do that, Tom? Same time next right, Friday. Uh, not next Friday. The Friday after. Two awesome. weeks, inshallah. Thanks, guys. Right. Talk to you later. Um, just send just send me a message on Hamza's Den on Facebook, and we'll link up from that point. Yeah. Hamza's. Can you send me a link to the Facebook thing? Hamza's Den, man. Same name. Hamza's Den. All right, I'll check it out. All right. All the best, Tom. Nice speaking to you. Thanks. Very nice. Talk to you. Take later. care, my man. Tada. So I just want to, uh, Jahamza, just very quickly, just sort just of one uh, second, Kev. One second, one second, one second. Just, just want to uh, very quickly summarize. Uh, so there were there were lots of things that were said there, and one of the things that was quite interesting is this idea that um, that morality can be something that can emerge and then still be objective. And obviously, the emergence of any property would be dependent upon these environmental circumstances. So if the environmental circumstances were to be different, then uh, then what your emergent property would be would be different. So this wouldn't be any anything objective um, at all. But actually, this was uh, you know very surprising. The other thing was about empirical verification of everything that you believe. And you know you mentioned in the initial the example about you know believing that your mother's your mother. Most people have not carried out genetic testing to check if their parents are their parents. They take this on uh, reasonable evidence their parents telling them that they are the people the fact that they look like their parents relatives telling them that they are pictures of when they were young example for example so this idea that only that what you can empirically verify you you believe is is, is very strange and no one actually in reality does this and i don't believe that people would do be doing um you know genomic testing in high school it's, it's uh, very far-fetched but you know fair enough i suppose when, whenever tom comes to the next stream 
Uh, and we can talk about that in a bit more detail. I suppose. Well, a couple of things that Tom said that surprised me. Um, well, not surprised me, but it was good he clarified. Was one that um, evolution doesn't disprove a creator. So that's brilliant. That, that was brilliant he said that, yeah. But then he went on to the subject of morality flex and the idea that lions shouldn't be in other animals and that the eagle shouldn't be and in an ideal world. None of them be eating each other. And, and it was like, what, what, what happened? I, I don't get it. <laughs> it just went from saying that nature is the object of morality yet when nature when nature something happens in nature it's morally wrong when it's the objective morality so uh, surely if nature is the objective morality and something happens within nature then that's morally good according to the standard of nature because it's happening because of nature um, did i did i miss it i, I, no, no, I, I don't no. know what i had or what so for example if the if the eagle lands on the rabbit and it's easiest way to do it is it holds it bounds with its talons and then it goes at it with its beak Otherwise, it, the uh, the rabbit might escape. Yeah, nature's brought that upon according to their worldview. Yeah, but then it's morally wrong. But then, if the standard is nature, and nature's doing this, how can it be wrong? It's it's inherently contradictory, isn't it? That idea. So it's, it's like you're telling nature you're wrong, but then I thought nature was the objective morality, and that this is what I, I didn't get it. I, I completely lost it, man. Anyway, um, it looks like this geezer's got something to say. Uh, let's see um, what stop, stop Spamming, I think it is, has got to say. Welcome. Correct. Hi, guys. Thank you very much that you're finally talking to atheists. Wow, that's a big step for you guys. I'm very, very proud of you. So what have you established so far? What have we established? Have you been watching the stream? No, we have a show on a Friday at the same time. Um, yeah. Just for, for a couple of years now, like a decade, but it's okay. Oh, are you from this gin and tonic show? Correct. Oh, okay, with Rob and that, yeah? Yeah, he joined like two years ago or something. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, see, we, we, we're not here to establish things. We, what, we, what we've basically done so far is to, first of all, do you accept the principle that um, the, if evolution is true, that is proof against the existence of a creator? Do you believe that or not? I am not an evolutionary biologist. Why should I talk about evolution? And that was my, my question. Are you an evolutionary biologist? No, no, that was my question to you, though. Do you believe that uh, if No, no, no. I, I'm asking, are you an I, evolutionary I'm biologist? Explain evolution to me. I'm not, you know what evolution is, isn't obviously. No, I don't talk about things I don't know of. Okay. Do you believe that human beings were created? No, I don't believe human beings were created. Uh, how do you believe human beings came into this world the way we are today? Well, my parents had sex. This is how I no, was created. No, I'm talking about human beings. You believe human beings human came beings. as they were, or did they come from something prior? Okay. Am I so unclear? I just told you, I am not an evolutionary biologist. Okay, I don't know. I, I am undecided. So I cannot you tell you something that I have not decided for myself, can I? So what do you believe, though? What's Nothing where I don't have a good reason to believe it. So what's the alternate to not being created? What, how does how the human beings get here then? What, what's okay. your, what's your... Do you understand that there are three options to an answer? It's either yes, no, or I can't decide. Do you understand well, that? What you believe. I'm not asking you to be definitive. Just what do you believe? What, what, what are the options? What's okay. your, do what's I need your... to repeat this? I don't believe. Do you believe you evolved from a common ancestor? Uh, yes. You do believe that? I believe that. I accept that. Right, and if you believe that's yeah, well, belief accept is the same word. If you believe that's true, do you believe that then proves the creator doesn't exist? No. What does it got to do with the creator? Fantastic. Alhamdulillah. So we got that. We got through that. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, so you've you've confirmed that as well. So atheist again, I'll make careful or uh, stop spamming off the gin and tonic show has also admitted that even if evolutionary Darwinian evolutionary bio uh, uh, evolution is true. It doesn't, it's not evidence against the existence of a creator. So if you want to try and bring an argument against the existence of a creator, leave evolution off the table because it's got nothing to do with it. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Second but it depends thing, what I'm creator thinking. you're talking about. What is a creator? You it's did not bring the creator into this. Sorry? What is the creator? I believe the creator of everything that exists, the first cause of everything. Okay. Then it disproves it. Yeah. Oh, it does disprove it. 
it deproves this specific creator. Um, okay, you need to differentiate. You're talking about creators in general, and no, this does not disprove no, it. If you're talking creator. about a specific creator, like the Islamic creator, that definitely cannot exist. Okay. Just so you understand, because you come with your little clever kafir, Monica, okay, we've not spoken about Islam in the stream. It's got nothing to do with religion, the stream. So you can hold back on your Islam, your Quran, and all of these things. We're just talking about... Well, you're, you're talking to an atheist. So an atheist is somebody who does not believe what a theist believes. So you are talking about religion. So no, I don't no. know how, how you can no, get no, how no, can no, square no, the using, circle here. No, 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 no. We're not using religion to support the idea of the existence of a creator. So, ah, thank you. So you don't believe in a creator. That's good. I'm sorry? Uh, so you just, don't uh, believe in... A, you're not talking about religion, so you're not believing no, in a creator. We're not using religion to support our belief in a creator. Okay, so we can leave creators out of it. Well, no, because obviously, I w the, the point we're making is this, atheist, we, we, let, let me take you back to the beginning because you didn't see the beginning. One of your mates saw it anyway, so he might have told you. All right, we said from the very beginning, when we speak to atheists, they bring evolution to the table as if it disproves the existence of a creator. So no, when that's a false. Says, sorry? That is false, I don't do that. No, I'm not saying you do. I'm not saying you You're do. saying atheists do. I am an atheist, so I don't. Okay, atheists I've spoken to do do this. So there are some people who do that. Okay, so why right, should right, I care right. about them? What we're doing today is using intellectual atheists like yourself to correct them not to do this. So again, I always to tell them not to do that. This evolution thing to bring this up in a discussion about gods, in my eyes, doesn't make sense. If you done. are okay, saying... You. If you are... Okay, again, if I you are... You. If you are saying that there is a creator who created the first human being and that everything came from one man and one woman, then I'm telling you, okay, that is incorrect. You don't have anything to substantiate that no, with. No, this is no, just no. your wishful thinking. This is no, your no. claim that you are making. No, no, no. You cannot verify or do anything with that. And that's no, no, what I'm saying. Just Leave it off the principle. table. Just a simple principle. When I've spoken to atheists and many atheists on Facebook and all of these things, they think... Evolution is a fact, therefore God doesn't exist. You've now confirmed they're incorrect in doing so, and I thank you, sir. Okay, that was the first point. Appreciate that. Okay, second point we said was that we can't prove the existence of a creator. We accept that, okay? Nor can, obviously, you prove the, disprove the existence of a creator, so atheists should stop making the claim a creator doesn't exist. Would you agree with right, that? Right, so we agree on something. Do Alhamdulillah, that? great. Do you agree with that? I agree with that, perfectly, yeah. Fantastic. So atheists shouldn't go around telling theists a creator doesn't exist because it's illogical to do so because you can't prove something doesn't exist. Yeah? No, that's wrong. That's wrong. No, no, no. You, you can't word it. You see, you're wording different oh, things. You oh. need to pay attention to your words that you're using. What did I say? If you are saying gods don't exist, then this is correct because no god in the last 50,000 years that people have tried to provide evidence for gods and have failed, no god has ever been demonstrated to exist. I mean, so it's time to let go true. and accept the fact that no, there no, are no gods. No, and this no, is why I'm saying know, there are no gods, gods until okay. somebody has been provided to no. evidence that they do exist. Is. Until and that happens, exists. there are no gods. Can an atheist prove God doesn't exist? No. Right, so should they make the claim God doesn't exist? Yes. But then if they make the claim, shouldn't they provide proof? No. No? Don't, it doesn't want to make the claim provide, is the burden of proof upon them? No. I can argue my it? case. I am... I just told you, you need to listen. I just argued the case. I can argue this. I don't have to provide evidence or something. The thing is that I have been listening for many years for the evidence for the existence of gods. None has been brought forward. Now, until somebody, until, Hamza, you need to learn to listen, okay? If you ask a question and I am answering, you need to just pipe down a bit until I'm finished. Is that okay with you? Go on. Thank you. If you tell me there is a God and I'm saying, no, there isn't, then you can ask me, how come you don't believe it? And I can bring my case forward and tell you until you have provided the evidence that a God exists, there are no gods. Okay. That's how easy it is. All right. Do you believe absence of evidence is evidence of absence? There can be. Really? Yes. Based upon? Empirical data. But I thought it was a logical fallacy to make that claim. Well, you're wrong. 
I'm I'm wrong. Am I wrong, um, Imran? So so uh, thanks for coming on. Start spamming. Um, I'm trying to understand because you welcome. You on, and the the first thing that um, Hamza asked you was, do you know what you the first sorry the first thing you ask is that what have you guys established? And it just uh -huh. showed you hadn't really listened to the beginning of the stream when we were establishing what we were trying to establish. And so really this this is why this conversation has not been fruitful at all. I mean, what we're, what you're really trying to demonstrate is you feel that there's no evidence for God and therefore you don't have to believe in him. That's entirely your prerogative. Now, what's happening here is actually you've, you're not dealing with anything that we've raised at all. And so I don't understand the reason for coming on if you haven't actually um, heard what we what we put forward. And, and I don't find anything that you've said so far compelling at all. I mean, you, you, you're conflating uh, belief in a a, a, a a divine being, a creator, with religions. And they necessarily don't necessarily have to coexist. You can believe in a god without believing in any specific religion. And in this stream, we've specifically led, left religions out of this. We can talk about the conceptual analysis of whatever god you, you think that someone may believe in, or I think that someone may believe in, but that's a different topic. Having different concepts of God doesn't negate the existence of God in the first place. Just like having different concepts of gravity doesn't negate the existence of gravity. It would still be the same. That's a separate argument from the existence of the creator in the first place. Um, so, I mean, the, the, as, an, as an atheist, one of the things that I assume that you do is you assert the fact that there is no God. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So the question the Hamza is asking you is, what do you base this assertion upon? So one thing is to say, the only thing, the only things that I accept uh, are those things that I can empirically verify. That would be one position. There may be other positions why you may come to this. So, do you? Th wh how do you assert? Where, what's your justification for ass asserting that there is no, uh, there is no, there is no creator? Should I repeat this, what I just said? Please. Okay. If somebody comes to me and says there is a God and then has nothing to substantiate that with and there's no evidence to show that there is a God, I can safely say, well, until there is evidence for the existence of a God, there is no God. So I'm saying until somebody comes up with this, there's no God. Okay, great. So now we have a bit of a criteria. You require evidence, yeah? So I, the next question that would come to mind for me is, okay, what evidence would suffice you? What evidence would suffice you as being evidenced enough to convince you that a God exists? Okay, there's two different answers, two different possibilities for that. One is that I can say, I don't know what a God is. So if a God makes claims as to the um, character of this God, then I can say, well, if a God is... I don't know, just say all-powerful, then it can provide the evidence. If it's all-knowing, it should know what evidence to provide. And if it's all-merciful, it should have the mercy to provide this evidence. I cannot know what this God can produce because I have never met any God, so I cannot determine what the capabilities of a God are. The other way of doing it is saying to make a claim that would satisfy me. And that is, for example, if I would have a Quran that is updated on a daily basis in every language on this planet so that it is ingrained in my brain so that I don't need a book in a human language, which is primitive and wrong, and I would find things that are actually correct, that would go a long way. Okay, so there's two things that you've raised there. So the first thing that you've raised is that you've never met a God, so you wouldn't know you know, whatever evidence. Got. So th what you've done in that first p part is you've taken you've taken the onus of establishing whether a God exists away from us in our discussion and you've placed it on a on, on God himself. Or, you know, God obviously, we don't believe God has a gender, but God himself. So that's one thing that you've done. The second thing that you've done is you've asked for a, you've asked for something to happen which is almost like a, the matrix equivalent of downloading something into your brain. Yeah, on a database yeah. you require requiring. So let's have a look yeah. at let's have a look at both of these things. Yeah. So the first thing that you that you've said is that um, God necessarily has to provide evidence to you, and you don't. But you don't know what this evidence would look like. Okay. Um, so so how in what position? So the question then comes is okay. Would you be in a position to recognize that evidence? And if you're not in a position to recognize that evidence then how would you know if the evidence was there or not? How are you then arriving at a conclusion? 
Well, if the evidence was there and I would be able to see it, then this God would know what kind of evidence would be sufficient for me to convince me. So you're, so you're missing the question that I'm asking, uh, brother. So what no, I'm you're, you're missing my answer. I understand oh. your question. I let, understand. Me, let, me, let me rephrase your question. Let me repeat your question, okay? okay. So that, that, that we understand the same thing. Is that no, okay? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What, what you are asking is, if I ask a God for evidence where I don't know what the evidence is, if that evidence were to be provided to me, would I automatically be in a position to actually identify it as such? Is that your question? Yes. Let's, let's go with that. So, would, so the, let, me, let me phrase it slightly in, in how I want it. So, if the, if you say that you're unable to recognize evidence that God would give you, then if the evidence were given, how would you recognize it as such? I don't know. I don't know the evidence. I'm taking now for case number A. I made two cases, A and B. So in case number A, I wouldn't know. because I would have to rely on the God to bring something that would be convincing for me where he or he or it or whatever would know that it is convincing for me. Okay. So I would so I would say to you that that the and this is not about you as an individual we're talking and this is usually what happens it becomes an ego centric thing. Okay, I, I'll take it as that. Yeah, not sure. The what, the the idea is actually we're talking about a, a humanity. So for us, it's not a. My position is not that uh, you would be able to that uh, the evidence should be given to you as if you individually were someone who's deserving of having your own specific evidence that would satisfy you because then that would apply to everyone. So you want the thing downloaded into your brain. Someone else might want the sky to open and a ladder to come down and somebody to come down with a book. Another person might want to turn into a frog and then back into a human. So this is a really farcical way of trying to ask for evidence as an individual. What the, the, the point should be that there should be an objective way uh, as poss much as possible that we could establish whether something is, uh, or something like a creator exists or not. Is that reasonable? Okay. If, we, if you go and you say there is a God, and this God would download the information into every person the same way, that there would be one unified message that everybody would understand, that everybody would know what this is about, then this would make a lot of sense. Well, because then we would not need books, we do, would not need this. So this is not a single thing. This is not something that I would want. This is the knowledge that a God should have about the creation it created. So, so I'm taking a, me as just as a token. I understand, I understand. So the, the, the problem, the, there is a problem intrinsic in the method that you're asking for, which is the downloading method. That's a problem, uh, and I'll come to that in a second, but that's the second part of your thing that you've raised. I'm trying to deal with the first part. So the first first part of it is actually how how am I going to and, and now this is an interaction between you and me as opposed to the creator. So if I if I believe, and this is a belief based upon and, and the word belief for Muslims is slightly different from just a, a faith without evidence. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're aware of that anyway. But if I were to say that um, evidence evidence of the of a of a creator communicating with human beings has been is, is sufficient in my eyes you and you would accept you would you would say okay show me what that evidence is and I could I could talk about a few things to say this is what I, well, these are the many things that would lead me to this conclusion and that might mean the, you know the, explaining the origin of the universe for example explaining things like uh, uh, the argument from freedom i.e free will or free thought actually having the ability to think um, in a free way and and, and other things like morality, you know, you know, you, you, I'm sure you said you've been doing this for decades. You know a lot of these things that are put forward. And then looking at phenomena like, for example, the the fact that in every society, virtually, in every people, separated by time, by language, by geography, um, people have come forward to say that a creator is communicating, and this is what the communication has been. And in that, you find a commonality. I.e., there's an underlying theme that runs through this. It doesn't mean that what we have now, for example, in the multiple different concepts of God, this is that same thing. I'm talking about in the original message, there is an underlying uh, consistency. And these are not people who are linked in terms of they're not 
are living next to each other. They're not sort of uh, speaking the same language or from the same ethnicity. This is geographically spread out worldwide, um, ethnically spread out worldwide. These the, the people have come with this mess sort of message from all types of people, and we can analyze whatever this this might be. So so those are the things that for that I would say that this. The, can if we analyze i'm just giving you the outline here that if we analyze here specifically these are amount of evidence for the existence of a creator now i haven't gone into those arguments in individually but i think that would be sufficient now just before you respond to that i want to talk about your second point because i think the second point is that it detracts from you an ability that you that we think is that, that would be important in, the, in the, the reason for having human beings on the earth so we we understand human that the earth is a created as a place for testing and necessarily for testing you require agency i.e the ability to make moral choices choose between right and wrong and if you're going to choose between right and wrong you need free will now if you have something that's downloaded into you like the matrix the choice element is removed so that would be that would be something that isn't required. Uh, that would be something that would be detrimental to the initial uh, plan of having the the Earth here in the first place. So that's I know that's a bit of a long explanation. I apologise. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you gave me a whole <laughs> lot of claims. <laughs> So the, um, it's very difficult to respond to each one individually now. Um, th th let me just take the, the, the last one I don't understand, I must admit. H how you get from one to the, one, the other, I, I, I don't understand that. Well, if, if, every, if everybody's programmed by God, then there's no free will because everyone's like robots. No, that's not what programming is. If, if, I, if I give somebody the freedom, if I, am, if I am not omniscient, if I don't have all knowledge, I can test something. I wouldn't need to test it because I know the outcome. If I'm a good programmer, I don't need to test things. Only if I'm an incompetent and, and, and infallible or fallible human being, I need to test things. If I'm infallible and know everything, I don't need to test it. This item I am producing doesn't need to be tested if it is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is distinguishing between good and bad, because I don't want it to do wrong things. I don't want it to do yeah, bad yeah, things. Got, if see. I'm going to go and punish somebody for doing something bad, and then I instill in them the ability to do something bad, and then still get them to do something bad, and then punish them for what they are doing bad, then I am punishing them for my own incompetence. Okay, let me give this you, is let me where the problem lies. Let me give you an example of what I meant. If God downloaded into your, your brain as a matrix not to drink alcohol, would you drink alcohol? Hang on, how can I? That doesn't work. You, you, you need to be logically consistent here. If I am given um, the ability to drink alcohol and then I'm given the ability to produce alcohol and I'm given the ability to consume this alcohol, then obviously I would be consuming alcohol, yes. No, but if this matrix... Think this thing that gets downloaded into Matrix every day tells you not to drink alcohol. Would you still drink alcohol? That is logically inconsistent. I cannot be told not to drink alcohol when I'm given the possibility to produce alcohol and consume alcohol, and alcohol is good okay, for okay. me. Then this doesn't make sense. Do you it's consume illogical. heroin? Do you consume heroin? What point are you trying to make now? Well, I just I just told you that it's illogical. Now you're bringing the next example. Should okay, I show you for how many examples are you going to bring that I show that they are illogical? Well, I'll establish it. Yeah. So you just made a point that because something can be made by human beings, that this can be taken and used by human beings and eaten by human beings because we can do it. But the point here is this. You use, we used alcohol as a basic example, and you said, oh, we've got the means to make it and pour it and whatever it may be. So we got the means to make heroin. So do you believe heroin would be okay in the same principle? Absolutely. If this is something that is good for our bodies, yes. And if it, is alcohol good for our bodies? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, based upon what? Our bodies produce alcohol. So, can I just, just step in just for one minute? Please, so, please. We've we got, we got someone else waiting. Um, yeah, it might be an idea if you go and watch just the I'm Sorry, uh, but I'm just going to go back to the... Because I think you made a, a very interesting point, and I, and I like the point that you made, which was um, that if you have somebody who's testing and they're the programmer, then they would know automatically what the outcome is. And, and, and definitionally, we know that God would be all-knowing, according to our understanding of God, and therefore would know the outcome of anything. So why do the test in the first place, almost, as you seem to be saying that? Um, and, if there, and if someone has a negative outcome, then this is um, bad programming to start with. 
So, yep. so the, 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 there's a flaw within this. So the assumption within this uh, way of thinking about uh, the theisms generally is that the reason that um, God has created the earth is somehow to create a utopia. This is not that. This is an area of testing. So the question comes, well, if God knows the outcome, why do the test in the first place? And that's what you seem to be asking. God, if God knows the outcome, why do the test in the first place? And we don't have to really think too hard about this because, you know, we've had... Well, you should. Yeah, I understand. I understand. What I'm saying is not that you shouldn't do think, have to think, not that you shouldn't think hard about it, but it's not necessary. And because and, I'm about to give an example of why something happened very recently that would tell you why this is the case. So we have had lots of people who have not been able to sit their exams because of COVID. Now, what's happened is that these people were judged and given a mark according to the understanding that their teachers had about their abilities. This understanding was built over maybe a couple of years and they decided actually this is what you're this is what you should get. You should get C, B, A, whatever that might be. And people were not happy with it. They were saying, no, this is unjust because I you know, I've been working very, I, sat, I, I know I, this is how I was performing, but I've been working very hard and maybe I'll get this. What Imran, can, can you get to the point? Because you're well, just bringing the old school teacher argument. It's, uh, it's nonsense. No, it's, it, is, it is that argument, but it's very important because... No, it's the, not. It's but, childish. Well, let me explain it. Let me explain it. Then you can tell me what, what you think about it. No, Imran, I know this. Come on. I can tell you immediately how to, do, how to refute it, how to debunk it even. I'm, I'm gonna, so let me make it and you can do that. This is a conversation. Okay. I'm, I'm first time I'm talking to you. Yeah, but people are complaining that this is taking a lot of time, but then you're wasting time by telling me things I already know, no, and you're taking a lot of time to doing it. Okay, then what I suggest then, okay, what I suggest then, you're, you're right, we're, 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 we, maybe we are taking too much time uh, with yourself. So what I suggest you do is come on again, we're on again in two weeks' time, have a look at our stream. Um, I can't, I can't. I have, I have my own show. I can't okay, come yeah, here all right. the time. Then, then yeah, enjoy your show. When is your show finished? It, it depends. It's, it's never the same thing. It was early today, and this is why I was able to come here today. Okay. Oh, I have been telling you people for the last 10 years, come on the show and let's talk about these things. And now, all of a sudden, after 10 years, you come and you make this your show the same time as our show. And now, now suddenly you say, Trust well, me, we, we can't talk. I've the furthest thing from my mind. When I've, I decided I've, what I've not actually heard of the, the gin and tonic show. No disrespect. I personally have not come across it myself. So... But it's nice talking to you, and I hope we, we get to speak again whenever it's mutually convenient. Um, watch the video and try and respond when you can, then. Take care. Ta-da. Bye. Gosh, okay. So that, let me just finish that point, Hamza, very quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. please. So, Sorry, one second. What, 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 justice, what justice would demand is that actually the person who's going to have a consequence from whatever test there is, is that they actually do the test. Imagine, you, uh, imagine you're created and then you're... You know, uh, imagine you're you you walk into the school and the teacher says, "Oh, I, I know you completely. You get an A. I know you completely. You get a B." Now, the point, the problem with that is actually the person hasn't done any tests, so that would be inherently unjust. So justice requires a test to actually take place, and this is the purpose of here. But uh, you know, uh, anyway. listen, he lost me when he said alcohol is good for the body. Yeah, I agree. It's right. just for anything, and this is the second time now. Second atheist. I hope my man here is not going to make it third. They said they wouldn't listen to God if they spoke to him. If they spoke to them. I mean, there's levels of not believing in a God, but even if God existed, you still wouldn't listen. I mean, that's madness. That's twice now. Anyway, let's see if third time's a charm. Okay, my man, welcome aboard. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, in fact, uh, sorry about the description of my avatar. My name is Pio. Okay, so call me just Pio. Uh, so I've listened to a conversation. Um, I didn't listen to the whole show because I'm a little bit late. Um, but in fact, uh, you are telling us uh, that you are not talking about specific God. You are just talking about religion. But, no, uh, the other I, way around. No, no, other way around. We're not mentioning religion. Yeah, but you're talking about God, right? But if you're talking about God... Uh, you are thinking about specific God because you don't believe in the Aster God or a Thor or whatever, right? You're believing in a creator God, your God, which is mentioned in Islam. And the idea of it um, comes hey, what was from... Your name? I didn't want to interrupt you without knowing your name. What was your name? Pio, Pio, P-I-O. Pio. Okay. And uh, the idea of this uh, creator comes from Aristotle, 
uh, where he is talking about uh, unmoved mover, right? Like no. uh, this is the cost. Can I, so, can I explain what we've been doing? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Been, yeah. Uh, sorry. Right. What yeah, we've been okay. dealing with here, what we've been dealing with here, is three uh, atheist arguments that we come across, mm -hmm. and a lot of lay atheists come with this. The higher up atheists don't use these arguments, but the lay atheists do. So let me ask you the same question I've asked all the other atheists to, to establish your position. Do you believe if evolution, Darwinian evolution, is true, that means uh, that is proof against the existence of a creator? No, even even evolution would be not true. It has nothing to say about God. Yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. So that's three out of three. We love that. Okay. I don't know why I keep hearing this then. I really don't. Wherever I go on Facebook or TikTok or um, in the Hyde Park, wherever it right. may be. Uh, I mean, and, uh, I mean the, the, reason, the reason why, uh, I mean, I believe in evolution, but uh, I don't uh, carry it out like the uh, evidence against God, right? Brilliant, because, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's try a second one question then. Um, mm -hmm. We've also said that if this creator exists, it would be the source of uh, objective morality for human beings. Do you accept that? Mm, uh, I don't believe in this creator, so I cannot answer this with yes. No, but if there was a creator, uh, if there will be a creator, but then I'll have to ask you again, what a specific creator you think about? Whatever that creator is, would it be if there was no, a creator? No, no, no. You cannot say creator because I if, I would, if, if no, I, I would I tell I you I it was Thor, you will say no. I'm Thor saying is, it. I'm saying uh, it. I'm not going into conceptions right now. Okay. I'm just saying, so, so if this is what I'm a, saying. I just respond okay. to what I'm saying. Okay, but but the creator, uh, according to your belief, must be outside of this world. So he cannot have moral values which are uh, uh, okay. applicable to our I don't know world. Why you're tied up in, the, in, the, in the semantics. Okay, I'll make it easy for you. Would a, if, if, we, if there was a creator, a theistic mm -hmm. creator, mm -hmm. yeah, existed, would that creator know what is good and bad for his creation? Um, this will also depends on because uh, how you are asking the question, you are already taking judgment on it because you understand it from your perspective. And since you, we cannot understand the creator, we cannot have any judgment about it of its moral or not. Well, who, well, who would set this objective morality other than a creator if the creator existed? Uh, no, again. You are making a judgment about that. Okay, you, you missed you, you miss my question. I'm, I'm going to say it again. Okay, yeah. It's very specific. If there is a theistic creator, would this creator know what is good and bad for his creation? No. 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 Because he's, he's not leaving. Uh, morality is always... Uh, uh, I mean... Morality is bound to, uh, to the environment. So we can say that something is moral or not. And this is why how we or everybody else is judging their morality. They have some right. opinion about that. Right? right. Do, so do even, you understand my question? Yeah, I understand. Because, but so but you, are, you are trying. So, you the are creator, trying. so the creator creates no, the, human the, the creator could be immoral, right? And we well, will not that immoral? That. Who would yeah, be, who would exactly what I said. Moral? Exactly what I said. We are the theist. Are thought that he is moral, but we don't understand the God, so we don't really know I didn't mention morality. if he is moral or not. I didn't we mention just morality. accept it. No, I didn't are you asking morality. me? About, you are asking me about morality. No, I didn't. I'll say it again to you. Okay. Tell me when you hear the word morality. Okay. If the creator. The theistic creator exists mm -hmm. and he created human beings. Mm -hmm. Would this creator know what's good and bad, right and wrong for his creation? Would he know what would benefit his creation and would he know what would harm his creation? Would he know this? Yeah, okay, maybe, yeah. Right. So if we want to know what harms and benefits us, then we have an objective standard now in the one who created us if this theistic creator exists. Okay, yeah. Right. Now, other than that, where else can we get an objective um, standard from to know what's benefits? Ah, you all? did want to say morality, right? Now you said standard. It's the same uh, thing. Uh, no, it's not the same thing. It yeah, if the, if the same thing, you agree to my previous sentence. You are judging 
you're saying your God is moral because he said so. You have no the ability to understand his ways. Only, according to you, only your God can understand his ways. If but your but God, you're but missing the point, it though. can be, no, it can be that your God created you just for her fun to see you suffer. So you cannot say that it's moral. Morality is bound to our environment. When we say something is moral... Sorry. Yeah. This is the second time I'm hearing this argument. Do you agree then that, for example, lions shouldn't hunt gazelles and... It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. If you say morals are good or bad, you, in your personal... In benefit, the, your standpoint, I'll, I'll, I'll you are judging it. You're getting hung up on the words good and bad, so let me rephrase. Beneficial and harmful. Uh, you cannot even say about that. It's just changing the words. Because even you, it's just words, right? And you, in your mind, have a, some, some judgment in it. And uh, you are judging the stuff based upon your experience. But your experience is bound to no, hear. No, 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 it's no, no. It's on you're earth. Missing, it's on you're missing earth. the whole crux, man. You're missing the whole paradigm. A creator, a theistic creator exists in this paradigm, yeah? And if this the theistic creator but, exists... But, but do you know his, 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 uh, what he wants to do with us? So that's, that, that, that's the key question, and I'm glad you've come to that. So you said a few things, uh, Pill. You said, um, the first thing you said that, that didn't make sense, why you, it didn't follow for me, is that because the creator is necessarily outside of this world, and you're talking, and you keep bringing up different concepts of the creator and bring up Thor, etc. Et and this is a fallacious argument. As I, as I said to the, the person before you, having different concepts of the ultimate being does not negate the existence of the ultimate being. Just like having different theories about gravity does not negate the existence of gravity. Uh, but, so but, so bringing, yeah. in, bringing in these concepts is actually a red herring and it detracts from the conversation that we're having. So let's let's simplify this. Let's call. Let's talk about. And you, you raised Aristotle. So let's just stick with the uncaused cause or the necessary being that brought about the universe mm -hmm. as as our f very foundational. Yeah, this is a fallacious argument. That's, uh, I didn't. I what, wasn't what able. Uh, yeah, I wasn't wasn't able to to finish my point because it comes back to the Aristotle where he like thought about it and uh, there must be an unmoved mover. But since physics shows us nothing uh, stands still on its own. Everything is moving. It, things just stops off because we are in this and this environment. So, so like, uh, if something lies on the ground, it's for us, it lies on the ground, but it's on, also lies on the ground because of the gravity or something's in this way. In fact, all things are moving. There is no need for everything is moving, so there is no need for first mover because everything is moving that's why okay. it's a fallacious let's, let's, argument to say there is something first sure. well, let's have this discussion so you're, what you're saying to me is and I, th and I think you're mischaracterizing the argument as far as i'm aware but what you're saying is that there has always been motion and there has never ever been a, a state where there was no motion Right, and even th this was like a, like I mean, a Muslim I mean, Muslim scientist who found it out. Let me just uh, let me flow with this a little bit. I just want to because yeah, I want to. Yeah. I, I may ask a question, but I'm trying to really get down to the. Okay, okay I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. So I'm trying to get to the foundational thought that you might be having in your mind, so that we can then go forward from there. So mm -hmm. things have. There was never a moment with or a, a state in which there was no movement. Is what you're saying? Mm -hmm. And fact, this yes. goes back. Ad infinitum. Yes. Okay. So, how do you then, in your concept of you know uh, the the universe as we have it, where you have an infinite regress, account oh. for the fact that we are in this place at this moment in time? I, how do you ontologically cross a a, uh, a, 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 a a an infinite series of previous events? Uh, first of all, I don't believe in uh, uh, the infinite regress. This is something uh, I don't believe in it, right? I've asked you now, was there ever a moment, and ever a moment where there was no motion? You said no. No. You know, so have, yes. have things been in, in, in motion perpetually? Because that's what that would mean. Yes, yes. Add, in, add infinitum into the, into the past. Yeah? Yes, uh, we, we cannot so find any, any moments to our knowledge 
yeah. with the the things are not moving. Sure. So this is then an infinite regress. No, Definitely. regress regress means like uh, the, you're losing something. Or no, no, the, it, means it, means a, it goes back. No, so no, it, it's, no. It's there is no regress. Right. Energy cannot be destroyed or created within. Or with, no, finish the state. Finish the statement. Energy cannot be created or destroyed within a closed system. Yes, and our universe is a closed system, so Absolutely. everything what is is in it. <laughs> this is what we're right? saying. Yeah. So what the, what we're asking you to do is to count for it. What do you mean account? Account for the closed system. Uh, we say only because it's a closed system because we don't know what is beyond that. We can only speak what is here and now. There are several theories what are beyond, scientists are working with. There are like 13 different models of it, right? We cannot say anything about it. So there's two possibilities. So either there was something before, there was something that's beyond the closed system, i.e. the universe, or there isn't something beyond the closed system. No, no, we can for sure say there was something before. Uh, the current data are telling us, uh, I mean, I mean that, that's why we have uh, these different models uh, of cosmology. So the data for their existence outside the universe? Uh, outside our universe. Yeah. And what's the data to show that there's an extra... Uh, actually, um, it, it's ba it's based on. I mean, I'm not a scientist, right? But uh, you can look uh, pre uh, paper reviewed papers where people are working on circular universe, uh, contracting universe, uh, self creating universes, and so on. And this is based on data. This is not like someone woke up in the morning and said, "Oh, I will invent an, an idea." Phil, with all with all due respect, the the idea that there's any data, we're talking about empirical. No, there are data. data. Okay, no, I can no, provide just, you right now, sentence. but there so, is. Phil, let me finish my sentence. I'm, oh, I'm not going to interrupt. Yeah. I just want to finish my sentence. The yeah. idea that there is empirical evidence or data or observations of something outside mm -hmm. or anything outside our universe is uh, amazing for me to hear. Can you can you please show me? Um, I, I can just tell you that, for example, Stephen Hawking, you know about them, who, who uh, like said, oh, Big Bang, this was the beginning, and our universe could be created without God. Uh, later, he changed uh, his uh, opinion from this because uh, the idea of uh, many worlds and multi-universes was uh, like clear to most of them and was based on evidence. It was not just like some so idea. I, I like to, Phil, I'd like to tell me what the evidence is for a multiverse, please. Uh, I cannot tell. I told you, I'm not a physicist, so I cannot no, bring I you like, so uh, okay. One of the I, I reasons can't. why, so one of the reasons why this was postulated, uh, the, the idea of there being multiverses, is that uh, it's very hard to explain how we have the universe that we're in with its fine tuning that we have to allow life to be actually existing. So one idea that was put forward for this is, and it's an idea, it's a theory, it's number crunching, it's mathematical, but it's not it's empirical. It's hypothesis, not theory, it's hypothesis. And the, the, it was put forward because it needs to deal with how, how this universe is exactly as it is. And that was, okay, we can't explain that. So let's make it a random thing in, a, in amongst an infinite number of universes, multiverse theory. And that's yeah, basically that, that's just only it's one idea, idea of it. So it's not you're you're bringing something forward as as uh, evidence when it's actually not evidence. It's just somebody's postulation to try and deal with a problem. Yes, uh, of course. And the difference between uh, like me and atheists and the theists are that the theists know already the answer, and the atheists are searching for it. And they're, but they are not searching like because you're trying to. To, to frame it like, a, oh, the, someone tried to make uh, make an explanation for it, and that's why I'm working towards it. No, they don't do it because they had, as I said, they woke up and have an idea how to explain it. It's based on data, on mathematics, on, and on physics, and on cosmology. Uh, so it's not like from the air. No one, if you ask me, uh, show me the evidence, of course I cannot do it. Yeah, I cannot do it. You are right yeah. about that. Uh, the difference between me and you is you know the answer, and I say I don't. Uh, we are working on this. Can I tell you the difference between you and me? Yeah. 
So the difference between you and me is that I, what I, what I've, I've come to a conclusion, and I've come to a conclusion based upon something very simple, that um, the universe itself needs to have an explanation, needs to have something that brought it about. We agree on that. Absolutely. So we agree on this principle. There's two. There's two possibilities with this problem that we may have. Either either there was something else that caused it, or it is as an uncaused thing. Okay. Now, I, I came from nothing. So what I would say is that from nothing, nothing can come. Therefore, this has to be something. So if there is something now, there always has to be something. The, the the next part of my dilemma then is is this something that goes on ad infinitum and we, you mentioned an infinite regress uh, even though you said you weren't doing that but that's really what you're saying then we have the problem that actually can is it possible to cross is it even theoretically possible to cross an infinity and clearly this is not the case so okay. therefore what we need to have for this this existence that we have now to be uh, here as we see it is that this chain has to necessarily end at some point and that would be the beginning of this chain now if there is a beginning of the chain that still needs an explanation of how this beginning of this chain of creation or whatever started and that would be something that isn't caused that would that would be outside of this chain that could cause this chain to start now that is a necessary thing because why why is it necessary because without that nothing else would be in existence and that thing would be outside of whatever that chain might be um we're talking about a causal chain or, or a contingent chain whatever you want to say and that thing would have to have certain properties and we can discuss the properties but for me i've come to a, a reasonable conclusion now what it seems to me like when i come to atheists is they say look don't know uh uh stop unless, stop unless, just, unless, just, unless just, this just, scientist tells you, me something I'm, I'm not going to yeah. believe anything else, which is almost a faith-based statement. But uh, brother, so we're glad to see you back, Marshall. I said, please uh, join in. Uh, so Sorry, my, Philip, I misrepresented you. Please go ahead. You missed the last guy, Sabor. Honestly. Uh, uh, oh. So, so yeah. Uh, hello, Sabor. Uh, I don't. I don't know you. I know you, but you don't know me, of course. But it doesn't take anything to the topic. Uh, so, may I answer? Uh, it's just the. One thing you you completely say wrong, um, Imran, uh, because you said uh, the atheists are saying something came from nothing. This is the thea, uh, theist claim, because nothingness doesn't exist. We cannot uh, demonstrate it in science. Uh, so this is like the theist claim, where someone uh, was creating something from nothing. Nothingness does not exist in the real world and not can cannot be demonstrated. Then you said, uh, of course, I agree to the cause stuff, right? That our universe has to be have has to have a cause. I agree for that, uh, but we don't know what is beyond. That's why I said, like in the beginning, you are con convinced uh, based on your decisions. And what you said uh, that the cause of this is God, right? Uh, I'm not convinced of that uh, because it can have natural causes. You cannot even because, uh, like in the opposite, you cannot like disprove that. So, do you, do you mean that you can't discount the possibility that? There is a natural cause, or do you mean it's probable and it's it's more likely that it is naturalistic rather than supernatural? Yeah, and yes, and I'm uh, and now I'm uh, explaining well, like why I believe the stuff, uh, what I'm believing, because uh, for everything which we didn't know until now, we found a naturalistic explanation. Yeah, I, I don't. This is this is the only reason. Why I believe in my stuff, right? No, but, I believe there is enough naturalistic explanation. So, there's a there's for... a big problem with that. There's a big problem with that, and the first problem with that is that if that is true, then it's not an argument because you can still have the problem of induction. Secondly, the problem with the claim is it's not actually true. So, for example, when it comes to the my ability right now 
to actually engage with you. I don't believe my actions are genetically determined, that I actually do have an immaterial mind and that I can actually engage with you. Now, you may be someone who says, no, I don't believe in the immaterial mind. I believe the mind is the brain at work and we simply don't understand those neurological connections. Nonetheless, this is an unresolved issue, even logically. Now, we may try and get a leg over each other by saying, no, my position is stronger than yours. Leaving that aside... I didn't say that. I didn't say that. No, no, no. I just no. said how I determined my thinking. And Imran was saying uh, how he determined his thinking. Fio, yeah. can I ask you a question? Do you think the universe began to exist? Once again, please. Do you believe the universe began to exist? The what? Do you believe the universe began to exist? Um, uh, this is, uh, I will not agree to the art of uh, how you're questioning me. Uh, if you're asking me if our universe began to exist, I will say yes. I had a cause. Yes, agree. Okay. And do you accept this cause has to be uncaused? No. <laughs> Everything has a cause. Right. So you just. But you so what so basically the cause of this universe requires a cause is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think we agree on this. No, and I told Imran before that the only difference between us is he knows what the cause is. No, no, forget that. Yeah, I'm not, saying I don't know. That's not the question. It's not the question. Don't jump okay. off that. Listen, let's say okay. to you again. Yeah. You believe this universe had a cause, yes? Yes. And you believe that cause of this universe had a cause, yes? Yes. And you believe that cause had a cause, yes? Yes. Infinitely, yes. Yes. Right. But then you deny the infinite regression. Of course, I said it already. Do you know that's the actual definition times. of infinite regression? Yeah, that, 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 that doesn't make any sense. You, you have to choose one or the other. No, you no, have. I don't have to. Uh, no, I choose. I choose. I, I think there is no regress at all. Because it is a regress. Uh, until, until now, uh, what we know uh, even about, like, and I don't understand uh, any quantum mechanics, but there is a law which says, uh, that energy cannot be lost or produced until now. Well, this is the knowledge what we know. So that, when you say sorry, regress, sorry, when you sorry, say sorry. regress, you mean something that, that's is going that's lower and lower and lower. No, 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 no. So energy cannot be created or destroyed within a closed system. Mm -hmm. right? That you you can't, and this is very important. There's hidden assumptions in what you're saying. So I'm happy with you saying energy and and. Energy cannot be created or destroyed within a closed system. But when you just make a blanket statement like energy cannot be created and destroyed, without that qualification, you're actually misrepresenting science there. That's yeah, but do you know what a closed system is? Like people thought that the Earth is a closed system, but it isn't. Okay, okay so it doesn't really matter about our semantical discussions about what closed system is. What does matter here is you try to make the unqualified, unequivocal statement that energy cannot be created or destroyed. And yes, that because, because the closed system can be much bigger than we think of. We don't know what a closed that's, system that's is. Irrelevant. That's irrelevant to what I was trying to correct you on. Of course, of course it's irrelevant because it's not a fitting of you. Right? Right. <laughs> it fits up perfectly. Exactly. Listen, I just like to understand this. The cause has a cause, has a cause, has a cause, has a cause. Yeah. Right. Right. But but, 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 but I told you. It. Yeah. But but uh, but you like dismiss my first argument. Oh no! Let me give an example about then. the let unmoved example. mover. Let me give an example, and then you can explain how to... we operate. Yeah. Just listen. Just listen, people. Okay. All right. So imagine this scenario. I've used this scenario in the past, but let's see how, how you handle it. All right. You've got a guy, a sniper, and he's going to take a shot. Right. You listening? Yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening. Right, right, right. Sorry. He's got to take a shot. And he's got that shot, but he has to get permission before he can take that shot. Yeah? So he asks his superior officer, can he take the shot? And his superior officer asks his superior officer, can he take the shot? And it goes back infinitely. Yeah? Will the shot ever get fired? No, of course not, because we have like not. a range. Why not? range in the military and there's one guy who has to decide it but if it's going back infinitely no it's not going infinitely no there's it is the one guy example, who it decides is. it no in my example it is so it's going back infinite number of superior officers 
Mm -mm. Will there ever be a shot taken? No, but your 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 example is not relevant because we I know think it's relevant. If, if you are talking about armies, right? About no, the sniper. No, don't get tired of, get tired of the specific. It, 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 even even the, the next one in the range will decide it. Sorry. Even the next one in the, in no, the no, he has to get permission, chain though. of the of the no no the chain of command he will to, decide it. The chain of command is infinite. If the chain it's of not. Command is it's not. There is only in one this example, general. Is, you can't tell me in my paradigm, in my example. What yeah, but I you're building stuff you. up which is not Will the shot get all. fired or not? Hamza is agreeing Thank with you, you that there has, to be okay. a, there has to be someone yeah, who right. makes the choice. So now we come back to the universe, right? And its cause couldn't cause until it was caused itself. Agreed? We don't know that stuff. Oh no, no, because as you just said, each yeah, has because cause. because the the universe can be infinite. Okay. We don't know how no, 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 no. You can't change the parameters. And how and, and and we don't know how it's working. Phil, 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 listen. You said the cause of this universe had a cause, and that cause had a cause, and that cause. You said that infinitely. Your yes. word. No, no. Right. I said yeah. our our universe has a cause. I don't know what what is the change. All right, behind let, let me start my question then, because you've just changed your answer now. Okay. Do you believe this universe? I had didn't a cause? change. I said All right. our we'll our again. universe is a cause. We agree Phil, on that. Phil, I'm going to establish the same principle again. You're going to agree again, and then uh, about five minutes later, you can deny you said it. Let's try it though. Do you believe this universe had a cause? Yes. Do you believe the cause of that cause? Do you believe that cause had a cause? Yes. And that cause had a cause. Uh, we don't know. Oh, you don't believe that now. So that was the first cause then. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It can have been a cause. It can. It. No. We can. We can go like infinitely. Infinitely causes. Okay. Right. So but wait. 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 What? Wait. But the cause, uh, why it started in the first place, may be the end of our universe. Like our universe ends, and this is the cause of creating a new universe. The thing is, Hamza's asking something, I think, very different for your answering. You're answering yeah. a question. He didn't ask. No, he's right? uh, he's he's thinking of of a hierarchy, right? That the one cause cause one cause one cause, but he's not able, for example, to think that uh, the uh, the destroying of our universe can be a cause of a new new universe. It's oh, like no, a, no, 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 no! Nothing to what I'm doing. Listen, yeah, to no, no, no. He, he, his point is conceptual. Yes, yeah, mine, not, me, it's mine not too. Multiverses, or whatever. His point is transcendent, or whether the multiverse is true or not. It's a conceptual point. Yeah, the, mine, the me, point is this. Just listen again, PL. Just listen, just listen, please. Right. The cause of this universe could not have caused the universe until it itself was caused. Do you agree? The cause of our existing of our universe could be of destroying of the previous universe. No, 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 no. All right, so you're saying. All right, so you're saying now the cause of this universe, there isn't could uh, be right. We don't know. Okay, and, but, then, and then, but you said that had a cause as well. Yes, the ending of the previous is like a cyclic universe. I know. Don't know if you ever heard of this theory. So every right. universe could be built upon another universe, uh, uh, which were destroyed. And then how so it, it will be like infinite <laughs> chain of reaction. <laughs> Uh, so you're can saying you the universe it, is infinite. So can, yeah, can you give it that cyclical uh, model? Can is there um, any evidence? For that? Uh, it's uh, it's the same evidence like for your God. No, it's not because when wow. it comes to God, we will use nature, we will use design, we will use the fact that right yeah, now it's it's the same right thing. Now, the, wait one second. It's the products of our <laughs> mind which has allowed us to talk on the internet right now. And additionally, when it comes to human values, human morality, all of these concepts which cannot be grounded in a naturalistic worldview, we can give you a myriad of arguments. When it comes to your cyclical universe idea, you cannot in any way, shape or form say that's equivalent to our idea of God because we have evidence for it and you have none. <clears throat> oh, now uh, you're talking about your Muslim God, right? A transcendent creator. We've not mentioned religion. We are atheists. No, no, no. Subo, Subo is I don't even think we've one. mentioned God. Subo was the one. You. No, Subo was the one who was mentioning God. 
So the model of the cyclical universe exists. Can you please explain how it works? A uh, cyclical model, and I'm just reading the Google stuff, right? Yeah, I, I, I can tell that. <laughs> um, it's uh, one of the several cosmic models which was in the universe no, follows infinite. Listen, listen I, I know what to read as well. Don't worry about that. Yeah, okay. What, this, what I, 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 I was, I was, uh, I didn't like lie that I know stuff. I already no, told you in the beginning, I'm fine. lying. Right, there is a right. model of it, and this model supports. Uh, that uh, one universe is creating the another, and it could go forever. It could be infinite. Listen, you can give something coherent. Being coherent, no way, shape, or form goes towards plausible or, or something that we have any evidence for. I can give you a model of the universe in which the entire universe is like um, in the structure of a Russian, uh, the Russian doll model. So you have a Russian doll within another doll within another doll going back. I'm from, I'm from the east of Europe. I know I'm familiar with Russian dolls. You're familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. You can do any model you like, right? Mm -hmm. What we're basically speaking about and what I was responding to you earlier is when it comes to God's existence, there's evidence. There when is no evidence, uh, especially not for the Muslim God. Oh, okay, okay. You know what? Uh, let me make a very simple argument. Let's see if you can disagree with this. Right now, you're on this live stream and you're here because you value truth. Or else you wouldn't be here, right? Oh, we are all searching for truth. We all like we are here now in this no problem. stream. As I should all... already. No, I'm in fact, the... in fact, no, this is a lie. This is a lie. I'm okay. the only one, I'm the only one who is searching for truth, and you already found it. Um, in regards to the belief in God, absolutely. In regards yes. to in regards to the belief in Islam, absolutely. However, when it comes to the origin of the valuing of truth, is truth intrinsically valuable or instrumentally valuable? Atheism have, has absolutely nothing to offer because from an atheistic worldview, all of us at rock bottom are nothing but atoms and therefore we have no intrinsic worth and therefore we cannot have things which we value intrinsically. So if truth is valuable to you, then that does not fit under an atheistic worldview at all. And that itself is evidence against atheism. Um, uh, we are not talking about atheism, but uh, again, you are wrong because the ability to think about this stuff is the ability of our brain. You, uh, so, so we can find us lucky because you, you, we, you, oh, you, let me let me please the wrong finish, Sabor, Sabor, please. You're going uh, in the wrong direction. No, I'm uh, going in the in the perfect direction uh, because it's the ability of our brain to think about this stuff. We are one of the very few being on this planet who can think about this stuff, and it's the ability of our brain. If I will cut part of your brain, you'll be not able to think about that. Oh, okay, uh, Piel. One second. Oh, okay. so, well, right. He's waiting, but go on. Here's why you are going in the wrong direction. I'm talking about the value of truth ontologically. You're talking about the capacity to arrive at truth. This is Ont a complete category mistake, which is why I was warning you, you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, ontological means uh, the stuff we know and we put our, on our list that we know. So you put the stuff on your list, what we know, and I put mine uh, stuff. Again. And and, and we, if you say how we don't know, it's the metaphysics. So ontologically, I'm doing exactly the same stuff what you are doing. Okay, look, you've completely misunderstood my argument here. My argument is very simple. Truth has no value under an atheistic worldview intrinsically. Why? Why is that? The, well, I'm saying why. Yeah. Because at rock bottom, we are nothing but molecules in motion, and there is no intrinsic worth to human existence. Therefore, all of our thoughts, feelings, values are nothing but illusions of the mind, and if anything, truth itself is evidence against atheism because our valuing of truth shows we don't at rock bottom believe in the naturalistic worldview. Are you okay? So let me ask you a simple question Are you accusing me 
of not trying to find the truth. Just say yes or no. I think you totally misunderstood my argument. No, no. Just say yes or no. Because okay. if you, you say look, if you I, say I, yes, I, you are look, on my I, side. I, look, and if you say no, you are accusing me look, and I'm not thinking. Look, look, there's two people listening to our conversation right now. I'm not going to say anything about this topic now. I just want to ask them. Do you think he understood what I was saying? Yeah, you're just accusing me that because I think there is a naturalistic explanation for this word, like, I'm I not can... allowed to have a thought about the truth. But what I claim all the time, you know what I said. I'm an atheist, I'm searching for the truth, and you oh, are... are That's are, good. Yeah, right? You I, don't, I, I don't know, I don't know, I not claim I know the truth. I right, have do you accept opinions. the possibility of a creator existing? Once again, please, Hamza. Do you accept the possibility of a creator existing, a theistic creator? Uh, I accept the possibility. It doesn't say right. that I, that I believe in it. No, 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 but you accept the possibility. That's fine. There is uh, a possibility, this, yes. Do you accept this theistic creator then would know what benefits? Um, oh, yeah, back like half Yeah, an we hour. have to go back there, mate. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no. Uh, I just uh, want to underline the point because you're saying no, you want the truth. No, now you've got a theistic uh, creator uh, that knows. No, no listen, listen uh, please, please, please. Yeah, yeah. You said you want the truth. I'm giving you a paradigm of a theistic creator telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. Would you accept it? The thing is, while you're claiming that uh, the uh, creator wants the good for us and the bad, is is the your understanding of it because you are in favor of it. But in fact, you don't know what the creator wants. So your your you sentence or your claim no, 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 is no, no. Like, I, I can't say it again. I've told you, listen to, listen to the words. Peel, peel. Listen to the words. Your so creator you told you, you told is telling you, you is telling you what the truth is. Uh, you yeah? don't know that. You don't right, know right, that. Right, right, right. So that hypothetical... tells me you're lying when you say you're seeking truth because you're not. It's a hypothetical question. Honestly. He's not... He's not telling you he knows the truth. He's hypothetically asking you if the creator told you to do something. He's hypothetically asking you, and you're misunderstanding it again. Yeah, even if the creator is telling me something, I don't know because I don't understand the cre creator. So I have, I cannot say any so how are you ever gonna find the truth, judgment about this if how he's are you good ever... or not. So, you know, this so, is, you know, this is beautiful, so, so the question, if he knows the good or bad for myself, Good night. It has nothing to do with his intention oh, to create Allah. us. See, this is why Allah says in the Quran, they, they, they disbelievers want to see me, and even if I did appear to them, they no, still uh, won't believe. Uh, oh, now we're back to the Quran. See, deal? No, deal? I can, it's been I a can pleasure. Just, I... It's been a pleasure. Okay. Take care, my friend. Next time. Okay. We're back on in two weeks. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> well, I, I can't get this, man. I'm, I'm mind blown. I it's thought these was rational, reasonable, logical people, man. And I'm hearing so all I'm hearing you... I'm hearing eagles shouldn't hunt rabbits. <laughs> so uh um I'm gonna be off to sleep now. Oh let's just see what this guy's gotta say. Uh, okay. It's actually quite it's actually 12 30, guys. So uh it's right, three and a half hours. I'm so, I've got, uh, we, we do apologize to you, but um it's three and a half hour stream. Um please come <laughs> up in. Come on We're the next one, you'll time. be first on. Sorry, mate. So uh, you, uh, you want to sum up, guys? Uh, Sabur, Hamza, mashallah. So uh, I was going to say, mashallah, uh, Imran Pai, your patience is impeccable. I, I do not have that patience. I mean, like I've seen people speak, like with the absurdities, me and Hamza just explode. But, you know, you've managed to maintain yourself. Alhamdulillah. That's why it, man. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. See, what I'm it's, trying to do, you see, um, I'm just trying to get to the nuts and bolts of everything, just to understand people's positions. Then you guys can dismantle it. But I, I want to know what's under the engine. And I'm I'm happy to see, honestly, the best thing I've heard today so far by three atheists who think they know their stuff is the fact that evolution doesn't disprove the existence of a creator when so many atheists have, have brought this as proof. You stupid theist, if, you know, evolution is true, so that proves you, alhamdulillah, atheists have learned something today. If that's all they've learned today, alhamdulillah. I don't get the idea of nature being objective, <laughs> objective morality, and yet when it does something, you can tell nature is not moral. You know what? I don't God get. Allah, 
Qadr Allah, when we were getting to the thick of it, my laptop just completely it started. Uh, you know when you have you know when you have up um, uh, upgrades yeah. that you're supposed to do. I kept pressing later, later, later. <laughs> and the screen, it completely, and then I went on my phone and I couldn't log in. So it was just ridiculous. I think Allah was but saving. Was... <laughs> I think Allah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you would have exploded, man. But I think it what, what was interesting was um, actually there wasn't anything that when when the, there was nothing that was definitive that people could claim that my logic and our logic was uh, flawed or anything like this at all. And a lot of the things that people were holding on to, like the cyclical universe, etc., and this idea that morality is some sort of emergent property that you know is like gravity but doesn't change when everything else in nature changes. These things are all either very very hypothetical or, or actually don't make any sense if you, if you think about them and i was quite surprised my, that people were bringing these arguments and in an quite an arrogant and aggressive way um it's it's surprising because we we need to engage with each other in, in, a, in a good way to try to help each other understand our perspectives but there was nothing really solid that i i saw from the um uh, yeah. The atheists, unfortunately, but it was good to have them on. I think it was nice, nice. Discussion. It didn't help that, that they didn't realize we were factory resetting them and we'd come from a completely different angle. And they were just coming with the old cliches. And it was like, you need to watch the stream, man. You know what I mean? We don't say God exists, yeah. we say we believe God exists. So, so uh, we're going to do this again in two weeks' time. Yes, Sabor. So, Sabor, Sorry? your socialized your socialized atheism is really this is the key here, isn't it? Do you <laughs> want to just give us a, just a summary and then we'll finish with that, inshallah? So, you know, um, a very interesting concept in the Quran, which is mentioned again and again, is um, how human beings have this uh, taxonomy to choose from in terms of their behavior, right? Or they fit into this sort of taxonomy. They either follow their culture, their forefathers, and, you know, society, or their desires, or their reason. And Allah says in Surah Mulk that when the angels ask the people why they are going to hellfire, the people will say, because we, if only we listened and we reasoned, we would not be of the people of hellfire. So reason, not following reason, is the reason why people end up in hellfire. Reason will lead you to Allah. Reason will lead you to Islam. Reason will lead you to what the truth is. Now, when it comes to atheism, atheists try to posit themselves as, we just came to the conclusion of God's existence, the God's non-existence by ourselves. Um, we came to this idea of biological evolution being true Darwinism being true by ourselves. And when you actually talk to them, you can start to recognize very quickly none of that is true. None of that is true. They actually purely socialized into this sheepish or sheeple, right? That's the best way of describing them. And I'm not saying Muslims don't do this. I'm saying they do and they shouldn't because they're told not to do taqlid and blindly follow. They're told to reason, to think, to reflect. However, they can't just blindly say religious people are blind followers. We're going to say, yes, we do have blind followers amongst us, but here's why we should reason. However, don't try and pretend like you don't have the same problem. A large, I mean, I, I've been to atheist conferences. I know about atheists a lot. They don't really act any differently to born-again Christians. They really don't. I mean, the first guy, T-Jump, he flat out refused to accept that Dawkins was doing anything malicious, which for me was unbelievable. Academics have written about this. I mean, we just took out a YouTube clip, but academics have written about how he is manipulative. In fact, I just want to share this quick thing. Um, you know, Dawkins wrote the book, um, The Selfish Gene. You guys obviously know about that book and uh, how popular it was and whatnot. Now, there's an academic who's actually written a book, and I want you guys to just check out the title of it. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Oh, sorry, 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 one second. I forgot I was responsible. Can you see this book? Yeah. Yeah. So this is written by a mainstream secular academic, the selfish genius, right? Which is a play on the selfish gene. So it's talking about how Richard Dawkins has completely misrepresented Darwin to suit his uh, neo-atheist narrative. 
And you, where will you find a reasonable, rational person that is going to try and defend this type of behavior? I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous that despite the evidence that was given to T-Jump, that he's just flat out refusing to accept Dawkins done anything wrong. I mean, I spend a lot of my time uh, reading up and researching this type of stuff. And I don't do it just for fun. I'm trying to do it because I'm trying to show people the truth is. It is shocking that Dawkins has gotten away with murder. I mean, he's nearly, you know, he's like nearly 76 or whatever years old. In, in terms of the public eye, he's seen as the main representative of evolution, all these types of things. However, in academia, he is someone who's regularly criticized and he's used in a, as a baton. Um, right. So what we have to recognize is that the sort of behavior that T-Jump was exhibiting is 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 not just it's not just um, that a few atheists do this. This is a standard behavior that new atheists have. And it's, it's good that you have people like this come on board and they, they talk like this. So we're not just attacking a straw man. People like this do actually exist. Brilliant. 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 So should we call it a day? It's quite late. Okay, brothers. I told you, didn't I? So, boy, you said 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. I told you, bro, these screens are mad. <laughs> Especially when the atheists jump on. Yeah, right. you know what? So, um, we're going to say two minutes time. Sorry? Yeah, I think next time we should get the atheists to jump on straight away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Because we get it out anyway. Yeah, because no problem at all. So, we're going to say a week on Friday, yeah? Yeah, I think so. Two Are you weeks available as well, Mr. Imran? Um, alhamdulillah, of course, inshallah. Oh, fantastic, bro. Well, actually, you need your calmness. It, 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 <laughs> it, depends, it depends on the corona numbers. Uh, <laughs> he, he might he might be in a PPE kit oh, next it's time. Yeah. It's a possibility, right. actually. You're right, yeah. May Allah make it easy, inshallah, and protect everyone Amen. else. Amen. All right, my brothers. Jazakallah uh, for joining. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullah. Thank you, everyone in the chat. Uh, sorry we didn't get to your questions. Um, but inshallah we'll try a bit more interaction we'll try and interact with the comments uh, next time because there's a lot of Muslims who've got questions about it as well and although the atheists come on the chat we should try and address some uh, Muslims questions as well inshallah yeah alright then, salam alaikum